The story begins with Fujimoto, who serves as the guardian for Rin and Yukio. He advises Rin to confess his sins and seek forgiveness while they are inside the church. However, Rin, being a troublesome child, asserts that he hasn't done anything wrong. Fujimoto notices a cut on Rin's face and inquires, and he asks Rin about how he got injured. Rin tells him that he simply fell down the stairs, even though he had actually been in a fight with Reiji Shiratori and his gang. Fujimoto continues to press Rin about the cause of his injuries, suspecting that Rin may have been involved in another fight. However, Rin keeps offering humorous explanations, including claiming he bumped into an attractive girl. At that point, Fujimoto became frustrated and buried Rin's face between his arms, urging him to confess to being in another fight without providing humorous responses. He cautioned Rin regarding his reckless behavior, and advised him to always be mindful of his actions. Due to his impulsive and carefree attitude, Rin struggled to hold down any of his part-time jobs. Fujimoto sternly reminded him that he couldn't remain at the monastery forever, and would eventually need to make a living on his own. Then Yukio, Rin's twin brother, entered and informed Fujimoto that he had finished packing and was prepared to leave for school. Two individuals, Izumi and Maruta, who had been cleaning nearby and overheard the entire conversation between Fujimoto and his children, began praising Yukio for being an exceptional student and skilled in various areas, despite being the younger sibling. They continued to praise Yukio for gaining admission to the prestigious True Cross Academy and Exorcist Cram School and said Rin, on the other hand, does nothing but cause trouble. Rin, reacting with anger, sharply told them to be quiet. Fujimoto then instructed Yukio to attend to Rin's injuries. After Yukio treated Rin's wounds, he asked him if he would be all right without him around since he was going to move from the church. Yukio tells him that everyone was genuinely concerned about him, as he frequently got into fights and couldn't hold down any of his part-time jobs. In response, Rin admitted feeling stressed by it all but insisted he wasn't to blame this time. He explained that he had been involved in a fight because he had witnessed Reiji Shiratori and his delinquent gang torturing pigeons. During their conversation, Izumi and Maruta entered and encouraged Rin to attend a job interview, having taken all the necessary preparations and even providing him with a suit. Yukio was upset that they had taken these actions without involving him. Prompted by Izumi and Maruta's suggestion about the job interview, Interview, Rin entered his room to change into the suit that was given to him to prepare for the interview. He noticed Fujimoto consulting a young girl named Yui. He reassured the young girl not to be frightened by the things she saw, assuring her of safety due to her parents and the possibility of relying on exorcists if needed. Yui left with her mother. Approaching Fujimoto, Rin commented that being an exorcist must be hard with having to get rid of things that don't even exist. Fujimoto disagreed, asserting that demons resided within human hearts. Later, after Rin told Yukio that he was able to get a job at the supermarket with the help of his natural talent for cooking, he saw a little girl trying to catch her scarf. He ran and caught it for her, and he realized that the little girl was Yui, who came with her mother to see the Fujimoto Itlie at the monastery. When Rin caught the scarf and was about to give it back to her, he suddenly saw a monkey-like creature, and the creature took the scarf out of his hand and ran off. While Rin was chasing after the creature, which led to a chaotic chase within the supermarket, it suddenly climbed on top of some boxes. These boxes were about to fall on Yui, but Rin shielded her from them. Unfortunately, she fell unconscious. Back at home, Fuji Fujimoto, Yukio, and the others were waiting for Rin's return to celebrate, but he was nowhere to be seen. Concerned for his brother's well-being, Yukio ventured outside in search of Rin. Eventually, he located Rin at the park, where Rin confessed that he felt too ashamed to return home after losing his job, though he couldn't provide a clear explanation. Upon their return, Rin saw Yui again, accompanied by her father, who had come to express his gratitude to Rin for saving his daughter. The following day, Rin woke up and saw a letter from Yukio stating that he had to leave earlier than planned. Rin noticed a multitude of small black creatures floating in the sky. He ran outside and began to wonder why nobody else could see them. Unexpectedly, Reiji and his gang approached Rin, requesting a conversation. In the alley, Reiji began with an apology and even offered money in exchange for Rin's silence regarding the fight they had the other day, as it could tarnish Reiji's reputation and jeopardize his admission to the True Cross Academy. Rin refused the offer, but Reiji persisted, suggesting that Rin's family's financial situation was dire and that Yukio got into the academy only for his grades. Rin punched him, saying that he could insult him all he wanted, but not to Yukio. Reiji got angry, then he became possessed by a demon called Astaroth and tried to hurt Rin. Blue flames started to emerge from Rin's body, surprising himself. Astaroth said that the blue flames were proof that Rin is indeed Satan's child. Satan, who is the ruler of the Gehenna, tried to take Rin to him, but Fujimoto arrived and exorcised Astaroth from Reiji. Afterward, a horde of demons started to appear and attacked Fujimoto and Rin, to which Fujimoto told Rin that they would stop at nothing to bring him to Satan. When they finally arrived home, an exorcist informed Fujimoto that he had tripled the strength of the spiritual barrier guarding the monastery. Fujimoto, however, instructed him to double the strength of the spiritual barrier, 
as he believed it wouldn't withstand the assault until the following morning. He revealed that they were under attack from Astaroth's kingsmen. Fujimoto and the other exorcists established numerous protective barriers around the monastery. Fujimoto then gives Rin a sword known as Kurikara. He says it is a legendary demon-slaying sword from ancient times. He informed Rin that he had transferred all of his demonic abilities into the sword, and securely sealed them within its scabbard. He emphasized the significance of the sword, emphasizing that it held greater importance than his own life, and cautioned him against allowing the sword to end up in the possession of someone else. He tells him to always keep it by his side and tells him that the sword must not be drawn. He says that once the sword is drawn, Rin's demonic powers that had been transferred and sealed in the sword will be awakened. Rin was shocked to hear that he is the Devil Spike and that he possesses demonic powers. She asked Fujimoto if Yukio was a demon too, but Fujimoto clarified that they were fraternal twins. He explained that Yukio had been underdeveloped and delicate, making him too fragile to sustain such power. He tells Rin that he alone inherited the demonic powers. However, their respite was short-lived, as Astaroth, once again possessing Reiji and his demon minions started ambushing the church, but the exorcists managed to defeat them in a fierce battle. Rin became frustrated and inquired why Fujimoto had kept such a crucial secret concealed for all this time. Fujimoto responded by stating that he was willing to raise Rin as long as he remained human. As they faced the ongoing attack, with the exorcists striving to shield Rin, he pulled Fujimoto aside. Rin urged Fujimoto to leave the following morning as early as possible and to find a hiding place where demons wouldn't locate him. Fujimoto handed Rin his cell phone, which contained only one saved number. Fujimoto expressed his deep friendship with Rin and assured him that Mephisto would likely provide shelter and protection. After their conversation, he pushed Rin and locked him in a room to confront Astaroth. Rin forcefully slammed the door and yelled for someone to open it. In that moment, memories of his and Yukio's interactions with their father flooded back, reminding him of the times people had branded him as a fierce, even demonic child in his youth. Meanwhile, Yukio's attempts to contact their home went unanswered, increasing his concern for Rin's well-being. Eventually, Rin managed to escape the locked room, and he raised his voice to Fujimoto, indicating that their conversation was far from over. With a powerful throw, he hurled a dagger that struck Astaroth in the heart, rendering him powerless as he collapsed to the ground. Fujimoto seized the opportunity to recite sacred scriptures, casting Astaroth from Reiji's body. He instructed Nagatomo, one of the exorcists, to bring the car around, directed Izumo and Kyoto to mark Reiji with a tetramorph symbol, and told them to purify him. Despite Rin's pleas to prioritize their injuries, Fujimoto insisted on getting Rin into hiding, emphasizing that the demons were after him. Rin misunderstood Fujimoto's words, believing that Fujimoto wanted him gone. He angrily departed, prompting Fujimoto to chase after him. A heated exchange ensued, with Rin accusing Fujimoto of being tired of pretending to be his family. In a fit of anger, Rin declared that Fujimoto was neither his father nor anyone to him, and should stop trying to act as a father. This confrontation culminated in Fujimoto slapping Rin. This accusation deeply affected Fujimoto, and their argument escalated to the point where Fujimoto, overcome by his emotions, slapped Rin, leaving other exorcists in shock. In a shocking turn of events, Shiro became possessed by Satan, who had come to take Rin away to Gehenna. Satan tells Rin that his power is too overwhelming for Asaya, and so whatever he possesses is doomed not to last very long just like Fujimoto's body. Then he opened the Gehenna Gate, the magical door linking Asaya and Gehenna, and he attempted to take Rin with him. In response, Rin vehemently screamed, demanding that Satan stay away and adamantly declared himself to be human, not a demon. In a shattered piece of glass, Rin caught sight of his reflection and was taken aback by the emergence of his demonic side. Satan acknowledged that Rin's bloodline connected him to Gehenna, yet he lived in Asaya, describing Rin as an extraordinary being. He then cast Rin into the gate, causing Rin to sink into it, and despite his cries for help, the exorcists remained incapacitated by Satan's actions rendering them unable to assist him. Fujimoto, managing to regain control of his body, stabbed himself in the heart and proclaimed that Rin was his son before he died. He fell into the Gehenna Gate, and Rin began to sink in. While reminiscing about his memories with Fujimoto, Rin unsheathed the sword Kurikara, restoring his demonic powers, and destroyed the Gehenna Gate. This action left Rin and Fujimoto in the realm of Asaya. Rin realized that Fujimoto died and started crying. Then Yukio came in and rushed towards Fujimoto's body. After Fujimoto's funeral, Rin stayed behind at his grave. Rin dialed the number Fujimoto provided for him, identifying the person as a friend. The phone near him rang, and he found himself surrounded by a group of exorcists, among whom was Mephisto Felis, a friend of Fujimoto. Mephisto expressed his pleasure at meeting Rin, and then presented him with three choices. Rin could either eliminate them, let them eliminate him, or take his own life. However, Rin surprised everyone by declaring his desire to join them. He adamantly asserted that he was not Satan's son and that Shiro Fujimoto was his only father. Rin expressed his wish to become an exorcist, driven by the goal of defeating Satan. 
Mephisto agreed to accept him but cautioned him that he had chosen a challenging and arduous path, one filled with painful and agonizing trials. Undeterred, Rin stated that he didn't mind and expressed his unwavering determination to become an exorcist without a doubt. The following day, Rin wondered why Yukio hadn't asked him a thing about Fujimoto's death or their own situation, leaving him curious about Yukio's thoughts. As Rin prepared to depart, the exorcists bid him farewell and assured him that the monastery remained his home. He inquired if they had seen Yukio, but they reported that they hadn't. Subsequently, Rin awaited Mephisto's arrival for his transportation. Mephisto arrived with a fancy car. Rin asked him what's up with the car and asked where they were headed. Mephisto responded that they were headed to True Cross Academy, leaving Rin surprised. Mephisto revealed that he served as the director of the academy and informed Rin that he would be enrolling as a student there from that day on. Just then, Yukio arrived and apologized for the delay. He expressed his joy at no longer having to be separated from Rin. Rin was taken aback by Yukio's unexpected appearance. During the car ride, Rin asked Yukio where he had been all morning since he couldn't locate him. Yukio explained that he had visited their father's grave. When they arrived at the academy, Rin was shocked by the revelation that Yukio was the freshman representative for the year. Rin recalled how, in their childhood, Yukio used to endure bullying and would often run home in tears. However, he took solace in the fact that Yukio was now pursuing his dream of becoming a doctor. Rin realized that Yukio remained oblivious to the recent events and resolved to keep them as his own problem. After exploring the academy, the students were instructed to head back to their dorms and get ready for the upcoming week's classes. As Rin searched for his dorm, he reflected on his own thoughts, considering that he had planned to take on a job after finishing junior high school anyway. He thought that the typical high school experience didn't hold much importance to him, because what truly mattered to him was becoming an exorcist. While trying to search for his dorm, Rin encountered a dog and decided to follow it, only to witness the dog transform into a human, which turned out to be Mephisto Felis. Rin was astonished, and asked if all exorcists had the ability to shapeshift, to which Mephisto clarified that they cannot, he is just an exception. In addition, Mephisto presented Rin with a key that would grant him access to the exorcist school through any door at any time. He issued a caution to Rin, advising him to keep the fact that he is the son of Satan confidential. He emphasized the importance of controlling his temper, as his blue flames could easily reveal his true identity. Subsequently, Mephisto escorted Rin to the classroom where aspiring exorcists were undergoing training. There, Rin met with his classmates and to Rin's surprise, Yukio entered the classroom, introducing himself as a teacher. In the class, he disclosed to the students that despite being the same age as them, he had embarked on his exorcism studies since the tender age of seven, having completed all his courses two years prior. This revelation left Rin in shock. During the class, his frustration peaked, and he pressed Yukio for answers about what he knew regarding their past experiences. Despite Rin's inquiries, Yukio initially ignored him, continuing to address the class. Eventually, Rin insisted on answers from his brother. At that point, Yukio requested the student's indulgence and expressed his desire to have a private conversation with Rin. In their private conversation, Yukio revealed to his older brother that ever since he received Mashu, which means being afflicted by demons, in order to see demons from Rin when they were born, he was capable of seeing demons. He further disclosed that Rin was the only one unaware of this truth. As they argued, a vial of foul-smelling liquid accidentally fell onto the ground, which lured a horde of hobgoblins. While Yukio was fighting them, Yukio called Rin an idiot and accused him of being responsible for Fujimoto's death as he pointed his gun at him. Rin said that he was right to call him that, but he exclaimed that he wouldn't dare point a weapon at his own brother as he slew a huge hobgoblin. After the fight, Yukio asked Rin how Fujimoto's final moments were. Rin answered that it was awesome. He said Fujimoto died while trying to protect him in the end. Rin explained to Yukio that his motivation to become an exorcist wasn't driven by revenge, but rather by a desire to grow stronger. He expressed his determination to prevent any more deaths due to his existence. Upon hearing this, Yukio acknowledged their shared motives, revealing that he too had become an exorcist for similar reasons. The argument came to an end and Yukio summoned the students back, offering his apologies for the delay. Later, Rin discovered that he was placed in the same room as Yukio, despite being the only occupants of the entire dorm. Yukio explained that he had to keep an eye on Rin, which left Rin feeling quite frustrated. Rin was reading a manga when Yukio abruptly took it away and urged him to focus on the assigned class materials instead. Rin said he's not the type to sit at a desk all day and study, but Yukio emphasized that to become an exorcist, such dedication was necessary. Yukio got ready to depart, revealing that he had received an exorcism request. Rin managed to persuade Yukio to allow him to join, 
highlighting the opportunity to learn from real-world field experience. When they arrived at the shopping store, Yukio instructed Rin to wait outside, but Rin insisted on going in with him. However, Yuko explained that only exorcists and higher-ranked individuals were allowed inside. He cautioned Rin not to wander off or touch anything before leaving. Rin privately felt like Yukio was treating him as if he were a child. Nevertheless, he resolved to prove himself so that Yukio would one day acknowledge his abilities and reliance on him. As Yukio shopped for supplies at the exorcist store, Rin noticed another nearby stairway leading to a beautiful garden. It was in that garden that he encountered Shiemi Moriyama, the daughter of the shopkeeper. Initially, she mistook him for a demon when he accidentally damaged the demon warding gate. She referred to him as a demon and demanded he stay away, but Rin, feeling offended, clarified his humanity and cautioned her against making hasty judgments. She attempted to flee from him, but repeatedly stumbled leading Rin to realize she had an issue with her legs. Inside the shop, Yukio inquired about Shiemi's condition with her mother. She informed Yukio that her daughter's leg condition was deteriorating daily. Every doctor they consulted had insisted nothing was wrong with her legs, which was the reason she had requested Yukio's presence. Additionally, she mentioned that she and Shiemi were not on good terms. Shortly after, while Rin was assisting her with her flowers, Shiemi offered her apologies. She explained that the garden held sentimental value as it had belonged to her late grandmother, who imparted valuable knowledge to her within its confines. Shiemi also confided in Rin about her desire to locate the Garden of Amahara, a place her grandmother had spoken of. Shiemi's mother brought Yukio to the garden and he was surprised to find Rin there. He introduced Rin as his twin brother to Shiemi, who expressed shock at the revelation, noting the dissimilarity in their appearance. Shiemi's mother advised her to let Yukio examine her legs, but she became upset and insisted that she hadn't been affected by a demon. Yukio reassured her, explaining that it was merely a precaution. He offered to check on her and assured her that if he found nothing, she would be in the clear. After obtaining her consent, Yukio examined her legs and informed them that the damage was caused by a demon, but reassured Shiemi that she had not been possessed. He explained that the demon responsible was not strong enough to possess a human. He further explained that it must either be a dark elf, greenman, or ent, which is a low-level demon that normally possesses grass and trees. Yukio explained that the demon had extended its influence from the earth through Shiemi's legs to her soul, and he was certain that the demon resided somewhere in their garden. He informed Shiemi that typically, demons enter people's souls through communication. He inquired whether she had ever engaged in conversation with a demon, but she affirmed that she had never spoken to any demon. Shimi suddenly collapsed after she defied her mother's order to abandon the garden for the sake of her health. Shimi recollected a moment from her past when, after her grandmother's passing, she had cried in the garden. She worried about the responsibility of maintaining her grandma's garden to prevent everything in it from withering away. During her distress, she heard a voice and followed it to discover a talking plant, which claimed to be a fairy residing in the garden. The talking plant asked Shiemi for her assistance in caring for the garden, to which Shiemi agreed, on the condition that the fairy safeguarded her grandmother's cherished treasure, the garden. She then awoke from her slumber to attend to the evening watering of the garden. After being informed by Shimi's mother about Shimi's past with her late grandmother, Rin approached her. He emphasized that her grandmother never intended for her to be confined to the garden. As soon as Shimi realized that what she had been doing was wrong, an angry Dekalp appeared and possessed Shimi. Rin faced a challenging situation as he couldn't directly confront the Dekalp, while it used Shimi as a shield. However, Yukio intervened by firing a nutrient capsule bullet, allowing Rin to defeat the demon once it separated from Shimi. After the battle, Shiemi's legs were once again functional, and she reconciled with her mother. The next day, Rin was pleasantly surprised to see Shiemi being introduced as a new student in his class. She had made this decision to explore the world further, and to show her appreciation to Rin and Yukio for their help. A few days after Shiemi's enrollment, Yukio distributed their test results. Shiemi had been quite self-assured, thinking she'd perform well in her test due to her mother's store selling exorcism-related products. However, to her surprise, she only scored 41100. This was because she had used her own names for the plants, instead of their proper names. Rin found this amusing and teased her. On the other hand, Rin received a mere 2100 on his test, while one of his classmates, Ryuji Suguro, also known as Bon, scored an impressive 98 one hundredths. Rin was incredulous and expressed his doubts about Ryuji achieving such a high score. Ryuji explained that he was serious about earning his exorcist qualification, and pointed out that other students were working hard to achieve the same goal. Rin, feeling upset, revealed his own desire to become an exorcist. This led to a heated argument between them. Renzo Shima and Koneko Marumiwa, their classmates, intervened to separate them, with Yukio also stepping in to calm the situation. Rin, Shiemi, and Yukio sat near a water fountain outside, and Rin inquired about Ryuji's background and intelligence. Yukio explained that Ryuji was a prodigy attending the school on a scholarship, 
destined to inherit an honorable and historic temple in Kyoto. Rin jokingly remarked that he's a wealthy kid. Yukio continued, praising Ryuji's exceptional academic and athletic abilities, and urging Rin to follow his example. Yukio then turned to Shiami, inquiring about her adjustment to the school. She admitted she was still trying to adapt. Yukio offered words of encouragement, advising her to do her best. Shiemi thanked him, and Yukio departed to teach another class. Rin, feeling awkward with Shiemi, wondered how to start a conversation. Shiemi confided that she didn't feel like she belonged in the cram school, because her goals differed from the typical exorcist path, and she didn't possess Ryuji's level of intelligence. Rin reassured her, emphasizing the value of diversity and uniqueness. Shimi was heartened by his words and even tried to ask Rin to be her friend. However, Ryuji interrupted, teasing them about their interaction. This upset Rin, and he clarified that Ryuji had misconstrued their intentions. In the midst of the physical education class in the arena, Rin and Ryuji engaged in a race to determine who would be the last one standing while being chased by a rampaging reaper. The instructor spoke to the class, emphasizing that the practical training wasn't a simple foot race. Instead, the objective was to prepare them for demon encounters by becoming accustomed to demon movements. He instructed them to focus on tracking and predicting the Reaper's movements during the training. Rin demonstrated his speed superiority over Ryuji, provoking Ryuji's anger. In a fit of rage, Ryuji resorted to kicking Rin, leading to another altercation between them. Fortunately, their teacher, Kaoru Tsubaki, intervened and put an end to their dispute. Mr. Kaoru took Ryuji aside and praised him as a top student, explaining that the other teachers had high expectations for him. He cautioned Ryuji to avoid causing trouble. Ryuji interrupted, expressing that he didn't intend to be disrespectful, and questioned why the instructor was only warning him, pointing out that Rin was equally at fault. Mr. Kaoru clarified that he had heard that Rin was a special case, personally brought in by the director. Therefore, he cautioned Ryuji not to get involved with Rin. Meanwhile, Konekomaru and Shima shared with Rin that Ryuji's intense determination stemmed from his desire to restore their temple, which had fallen into disrepair due to a tragic event called the Blue Knight. Rin inquired about the Blue Knight, revealing that he had never heard of it. Konekomaru and Shima were astonished, and explained that the Blue Knight occurred 16 years ago, when Satan massacred the world's most prominent clergymen. They described how the exorcists started bleeding and spouting blue flames from their mouths. Shima explained that the blue flames symbolized Satan, and their priest, who was still in training at the time, hid in fear until dawn. They said that after the Blue Knight, their priest completed his training and took over the temple. However, due to the deaths of so many monks on the same day, people stopped coming, and the temple earned a reputation as the Cursed Temple. Kona Komaru and Shima revealed that they were apprentice monks at the temple, and had followed Ryuji to exercise the cram school, in hopes of restoring it. They urged Rin to be understanding of Ryuji's burdens, given the responsibilities he had. After Renzo and Konekomaru explained to Rin about Ryuji's dark past and his goal to defeat Satan, Ryuji issued a challenge to Rin, daring him to make contact with the Reaper without incurring its aggression, so he could prove that he was determined to become an exorcist. However, Rin refused, emphasizing that he wasn't foolish enough to endanger his life, as he too had a personal objective to attain. This response infuriated Ryuji, prompting him to descend toward the Reaper on his own in an attempt to demonstrate his bravery. Nevertheless, the Reaper sensed the distress in Ryuji's thoughts and appeared poised to strike at him, but Rin promptly intervened, shielding him from the demon's assault. With a determined gaze, Rin commanded the Reaper to release its grip. Subsequently, back in the classroom, Rin struggled to focus on his studies due to his unruly bangs. At this moment, Ryuji approached Rin and offered him a hair clip to tie back his hair, expressing gratitude for saving him. Rin was taken aback by this gesture, finding it somewhat creepy and unsettling, which visibly irritated Ryuji. Rin and Ryuji fought over the last yakisoba bun snack, drawing the attention of their fellow students. Yukio realized he was late when he spotted the large crowd gathered in front of the store. Just as he arrived, three female students, Kashino, Nishiwaki, and Omoto, approached him, each holding a food pack they had prepared. They offered Yukio their homemade lunches and asked him to pick which one he wanted to eat first. However, a quarrel erupted among the girls as they vied for Yukio's attention, leaving him in a dilemma. He was aware that choosing one of them would likely upset the others. To avoid the situation, he used Rin as an excuse and they hurried into the student cafeteria. Inside, Rin was amazed by the variety of food available, including Italian and French cuisine. However, he was taken aback when he realized that the food was quite expensive. This angered him. Consequently, they decided to meet with Mephisto in his office to request lower cafeteria food prices. Mephisto, though, explained that this was impossible 
since the school provided top-notch meals prepared with premium ingredients by highly skilled chefs. Rin voiced his opinion that the student cafeteria didn't need to offer top-notch cuisine. Mephisto countered by explaining that in his culture, a person's life is enriched by experiencing first-rate food. This left Rin and Yukio surprised when they saw Mephisto eating a cup of noodles shortly after making the statement. Nonetheless, Mephisto decided to provide Rin with a 2,000 yen bill, roughly equivalent to $20 as his monthly allowance. Rin expressed his dissatisfaction, believing that it wouldn't suffice for the entire entire month. After leaving Mephisto's office, Yukio recalled their late father's words about how people shouldn't rely solely on food. Rin then asked Yukio if he was comfortable with the 2,000 yen allowance, but Yukio explained that he was already earning as an instructor and receiving compensation for his work as an exorcist. As a solution, Yukio proposed that he would give Rin money to buy groceries, and he would prepare meals for both of them. Rin, following this arrangement, prepared their food at night and stored it in the refrigerator, planning to eat it the next day. They both retired to bed after making these arrangements. The following day, Rin was shocked to discover that the food he had prepared had disappeared. He immediately suspected Yukio because they were the only occupants of the dorm. However, Yukio denied any involvement. They heard a noise emanating from the kitchen and wondered who might be inside. To their astonishment, they found Mephisto cooking. Yukio asked if Mephisto had been the one responsible for preparing their meals all along, but Mephisto clarified that he was merely a temporary substitute. He explained that the actual chef was Ukobak, a stove spirit that sneaked into the kitchen while humans were asleep to improve the flavor of their food. Mephisto conveyed that Ukobak had been diligently performing his duties, but their intrusion into the kitchen had agitated him. Ukobak is now in a snit and has boycotted his job. As a result, Mephisto would be in charge of their meals until Ukobak's mood improved. Rin and Yukio, however, were not pleased with this arrangement. Subsequently, Rin attempted to appease Ukobak by cleaning the kitchen, but that wasn't sufficient. To resolve the situation, they decided to engage in a culinary competition, showcasing their cooking skills. Through this friendly competition, they discovered each other's culinary talents and formed a bond, praising each other's abilities. The next day, when Kashino, Nishiwaki, and Omoto observed Yukio eating and commended his versatile skills, including cooking, Yukio modestly claimed that his older brother Rin had prepared the meal. However, they remained skeptical, which left Rin feeling disheartened. When he got back to his dorm, Rin found Shiemi waiting at the door. She said she came to deliver Yukio's order. Yukio extended an invitation for her to come inside and have tea with them. Unbeknownst to them, Kashino, Nishiwaki, and Omoto secretly observed the situation, growing envious after witnessing Shiemi enter the boy's dorm and suspecting her to be Yukio's girlfriend. Yukio introduced Shiemi to Ukabak, and she expressed her gratitude for the tea before stating that she should be heading back since it was getting late. As she prepared to leave, Yukio gave her a magical key that connected the dorm to the supply shop and accompanied her. Meanwhile, Kashino, Nishiwaki, and Omoto remained outside, even though it was quite late. They were waiting for Shiemi to leave, suspecting she might be spending the night in Yukio's room. When she didn't appear, they grew curious and decided to enter the dorm to search for her. They entered the kitchen and found already made food in the refrigerator, assuming Shiemi had cooked it for Yukio. Annoyed, they disposed of all the food, frustrated that Yukio hadn't touched the meals they had prepared, but seemed to enjoy Shiemi's cooking. Ukabak, who had grown in size and become angry, appeared behind them, intending to punish them. Rin and Yukio heard a loud noise and rushed to the kitchen. When they arrived, they discovered that Ukabak had placed the three girls in a large pot, planning to cook them as punishment. Rin attempted to calm Ukabak down, and the girls explained that they only wanted Yukio to eat the lunch they had prepared. Upon hearing this, Rin blamed the entire situation on Yukio and instructed him to eat all the lunch the girls had made as a form of punishment. Shimi was getting ready for school when her mother asked if she had made any new friends. She replied with a yes, even though she knew she was not being truthful. On her way to school, she recalled when Rin had stated that he and Shimi were not friends. She struggled to hold back tears and resolved to make new friends independently without relying on Rin. When she got to school, she spotted Izumo and Paku. She called out to them, but before she could say anything, she stumbled and fell. Izumo teased her by calling her a klutz, and she left. However, Paku expressed concern and asked if Shiemi was alright before leaving as well. Rin noticed Shiemi on the ground and inquired about what had happened, but she remained silent and walked away. In the classroom, Yukio informed the students about the upcoming X-Wire authorization exam, an exam required to become an exorcist. He emphasized that once they were promoted to X-Wire, they would undergo specialized combat training making the exam a challenging hurdle to overcome. Yukio continued, announcing a week-long boot camp to prepare for the exam. He made it clear that participation in the boot camp was optional and distributed forms for the students to indicate their decision and specify the milestone or title they aimed to achieve. These forms needed to be submitted by Monday. Rin, unable to understand everything Yukio had said, approached Ryuji to seek clarification about the term Meister. Ryuji was surprised that Rin didn't know the meaning of Meister's expression of his desire to become an exorcist. Konekomaru then enlightened 
Rin, explaining that a Meister was a technical qualification crucial for becoming an exorcist, essentially a title bestowed upon individuals who displayed exceptional skills. He went on to elaborate that there were five distinct titles to aspire to, Knight, Dragoon, Tamer, Arya, and Doctor. Konekamaru also revealed that anyone who acquired at least one of these titles could become an exorcist. Rin thanked Konekamaru for the explanation and inquired about their choice of titles. Konekomaru disclosed that he and Shima were aiming for Arya, which referred to Meisters who battled demons through recitations of the Bible and sacred scriptures. He also mentioned that Bon was pursuing both Arya and Dragoon. Konekomaru informed Rin that Yukio had already acquired two titles, Doctor and Dragoon. This left Rin contemplating which title to pursue. Ryuji clarified that Dragoon Meisters fought with firearms, while Nightmeisters used swords. Rin concluded that he would likely become a knight since he possessed a sword. In the next class, their instructor Igor provided a lesson on summoning demons to serve as familiars and put their skills to the test. Zumo went first and successfully summoned two Bayako, which were white foxes. The entire class was astonished. Shimi volunteered to go next and managed to summon an infant Greenman. Their instructor commended their efforts. After the class, Shimi approached Izumo and expressed her desire to be friends. Izumo agreed. However, Shimi was unaware that Izumo had ulterior motives. She eventually turned Shimi into her servant, yet Shimi remained unaware, thinking she was simply assisting a friend. Rin observed the situation and couldn't help but feel that Shami was being treated like an errand girl. He questioned Yukio about why the boot camp was taking place in their dorm. Yukio explained that it was because no one else occupied the dorm except for them. Soon, other students arrived at the dorm, and Ryuji commented that it looked like an abandoned hotel. Izumo also remarked on the creepy atmosphere and handed her bag to Shiemi to carry. Paku added that Shiemi should voice her objections if she didn't want to carry them, but Shiemi insisted that she didn't mind and was simply helping out a friend. After the students completed the test, assigned by Yukio, Izumo suggested that Paku accompany her to the bathroom for a bath. Shiemi followed them, but when they reached the bathroom, Izumo stopped her from entering. Instead, she asked Shiemi to fetch some fruit milk for her. This left Shiemi feeling disheartened. Rin intervened and questioned why Shiemi was acting like a messenger. Shiemi, however, asserted that she was not and emphasized that she was simply helping out a friend. She expressed her frustration with always relying on others and being rescued, longing to become strong enough to rescue someone else much like how Rin and Yukio helped others. Shiemi confided in Rin that Izumo was her first friend, emphasizing that he couldn't understand since he had always been strong and had friends. In the meantime, Paku expressed to Izumo that she believed Izumo was being too hard on Shiemi. Izumo confessed that she didn't truly consider Shiemi a friend, finding it peculiar that Shiemi willingly followed her instructions, without forcing her. However, Izumo assured Paku that she would never treat her the same way as Shiemi because Paku was her best friend. She also expressed gratitude to Paku for enrolling in the exorcist cram school with her. But to Izumo's surprise, Paku revealed her intention to quit the cram school explaining that she couldn't comprehend the classes and wasn't willing to risk her life in battles. She also voiced her discomfort with how Izumo often made fun of others. Their conversation was interrupted when they spotted a demon on the ceiling, causing them to scream. Rin and Shimi's discussion was interrupted by screams from Izumo and her friend Noriko Paku's room. Rin instructed Shiemi to fetch Yukio while he hurried to their assistance. Following Rin's rescue of Izumo from her two threatening Biako familiars, which sensed her fear, Nabarius snuck into the dorm. Rin engaged in a struggle against the Nabarius while Shiemi tended to Paku's injuries. Rin refrained from unsheathing Kurakara to conceal his true identity from his peers, making him vulnerable as the Nabirius pinned him down and began to strangle him. Fortunately, Yukio arrived in the nick of time, firing at the Nabirius, compelling it to retreat. Subsequently, when Rin noticed a distressed Izumo blaming herself for not being able to assist Paku, he offered her his shirt and encouraged her to go change. The following morning, Izumo returned Rin's shirt and cautioned him not to reveal that he had witnessed her crying the day before, to which he agreed not to disclose. She expressed her gratitude for saving her and Paku's lives. Subsequently, Yukio arrived to provide medical care for Paku, ensuring her recovery in the next two to three days. On their way back, Rin inquired about the nature of the demon they had encountered. Yukio explained that he was still investigating its point of entry and whereabouts. While confined to her sickbed, Paku remarked to Izumo that Rin appeared quite cute, and asked Izumo if she found him cool as well. Izumo, taken aback, inquired if Paku had lost her mind and questioned the source of such a statement. Paku proceeded to mention that Yukio possessed his own allure, though the twins didn't bear a strong resemblance. However, Izumo's thoughts were elsewhere. She was solely concerned about Paku, and what Paku had just expressed didn't hold any significance to her. Paku noticed Izumo's worry and disclosed her decision to quit the cram school. In response, Izumo offered an apology, attributing everything to her own shortcomings, and lamenting that things might have been different 
if she had a better personality. Paku encouraged her to abandon such self-deprecating thoughts. She stated that she had realized the cram school was an entirely distinct world for her, but that this fact didn't alter the nature of their friendship. Paku implored Izumo to cease worrying, and reassured her that she cherished Izumo just the way she was. On the rooftop, Rin contemplated the demon's statement about following his master's commands knowing that the demon was referring to Satan. He was also aware that demons were after him. While lost in thought, Shiemi unexpectedly appeared, and their heads accidentally collided. Afterward, he helped her with the laundry. Shimi shared her intention to assist everyone in various ways, starting with their laundry. In the classroom, a female teacher asked Izumo to recite a homework passage, but she was so distracted that she couldn't recall it or answer the questions. This behavior surprised everyone since it was unusual for her. The teacher expressed disappointment and turned to Ryuji, who surprisingly recited the passage. As the class ended, students praised Ryuji. Rin casually mentioned to Ryuji that he was indeed a smart student. Konekomaru, however, clarified that Ryuji's strength lay in his exceptional memory rather than raw intelligence. Izumo chimed in, asserting that memorization was a skill anyone could acquire and was nothing remarkable. Ryuji overheard Izumo's comment and made fun of her, saying that she couldn't even memorize a simple set of four lines. Izumo, irritated by his remark, clarified that it wasn't an issue of her inability to memorize, but rather a conscious choice. She explained that Arias, while reciting, were completely defenseless and relied on their companions for protection, essentially labeling them as a burden. Ryuji's anger flared, and he confronted Izumo, asking if she was genuinely belittling an aspiring Arya right in front of him. Approaching her with visible fury in his eyes, Ryuji moved closer to Izumo, who challenged him to hit her if he dared. In response, Ryuji declared his long-standing dislike for her, and warned her not to mock people's dreams. Still, Izumo even mocked Ryuji's dream of becoming an exorcist to defeat Satan. Ryuji inquired about Izumo's motivation for becoming an exorcist, urging her to open up. However, Izumo remained tight-lipped, mentioning that she had never disclosed her intentions to anyone as she wasn't seeking attention like Ryuji. This infuriated Ryuji, and he angrily confronted Izumo, grabbing her by the collar. In her attempt to respond, Izumo accidentally slapped Rin instead. An upset Rin admonished them, suggesting that if they intended to fight, they should find another location for it. Yukio intervened and punished them by giving each of them a unique demon that resembled a rock, known as Baryon. The demon grew heavier the longer they held it. Yukio instructed them to lift it and form a strong bond. He explained that the objective of the boot camp was not just to enhance their academic skills, but also to foster friendship. In response, Izumo expressed her preference for death over getting along with them. This upset Yukio, who emphasized that an exorcist cannot face battles alone. Shortly after Yukio's departure for a mission, a power outage plunged their dorm into darkness, and the same Nabarius demon reappeared. To shield against the Nabarius's advance, Shiemi enlisted the aid of her green man familiar, Nichan, to provide a tree barricade to prevent the Nabarius from getting closer. Rin willingly stepped forward to draw the demon's attention away, allowing his fellow students to make an escape. Nevertheless, the Nabarius cunningly split itself into two entities. One continued to pursue Rin, while the other stayed behind to try to bypass Shiemi's wooden defense. Rin hastened to the dorm's power control room with the aim of restoring the lights, but Nabarius forcefully flung him away from the controls. In this dire situation, Rin couldn't conceal his blue flames, which led to the sudden appearance of an academy teacher, Igor Neuhaus, emerging from the shadows. Igor later confessed to orchestrating the attacks on their dorm to verify Rin's identity as Satan's offspring. Enraged by this revelation, Rin unsheathed Kurakara and slew the Nabarius using his powerful flames, driving Igor to flee the scene. The air hung heavy with a sense of confusion as Rin Okumura tried to fathom the sight before him. There, standing not as an adversary but as a colleague, was Mr. Nohias. Rin's mind raced back to their previous encounter, the enmity they shared, and the danger that had loomed over them. Yet now, Mr. Nohayas was inexplicably behind Yukio, wearing the same exorcist uniform. As Rin was trying to process this, from the rooftop, the figure of Mephistopheles made a dramatic appearance. With an impish grin, he kicked Mr. Nohayas playfully in the back. Rin's bewilderment was mirrored in the expressions of his fellow students. As the students struggled to wrap their minds around the sudden turn of events, another layer of astonishment unfolded. At a snap of Mephisto's fingers, instructors emerged from various corners of the area. They swiftly attended to the wounded at Mephisto's demand, drawing a mix of relief and further intrigue from the students. Mephisto wasn't done with his surprises. He revealed that the rigorous boot camp was also their X-Wire authorization examination. Instructors had been strategically positioned throughout the building, observing the students' performances during the camp. The bewildering sequence of events had left the students dazed and injured. They were in the treatment room, receiving care for their injuries. Among them, Shiemi lay unconscious, a testament to the trials they had endured. None of them had foreseen the camp being a test, and they speculated about what the result 
results might entail based on their performances. Later in the evening, a heavy air of tension lingered as Yukio confronted Mr. Nohias. His tone was stern as he questioned the reasons behind Mr. Nohias' extreme actions during the examination. These actions had exposed the students to unnecessary danger and had nearly revealed Rin's true power to his peers. In a startling revelation, Mr. Nohias claimed that his actions had been carried out under the orders of Mephisto himself. He explained that their purpose was to assess whether Rin's power could be harnessed as a potential weapon for their organization's future endeavors. Yukio gave Mr. Nohias a clear message not to underestimate Rin. As Mr. Nohias walked away, he assured Yukio that he had no intention of killing Rin. The parting words left Yukio feeling unsettled and contemplative. In the quiet of the night, Shiemi was alone in her family shop, saving the company of her family. She was reminiscing about the events of the previous day and the challenges she and her friends had faced. It was in this serene moment that Yukio entered entered the shop his presence palpable with purpose. Yukio revealed his intention to discuss Shiemi's plans. Shimi expressed her indecisiveness, as she hadn't joined the cram school intending to become an exorcist. Yukio reminded her of the day they first met, a day that marked the beginning of his journey as an exorcist. Shiemi revealed that she had always looked up to Yukio since that moment, his determination and strength inspiring her. Yukio also confessed that he, too, had once looked up to his brother, Rin. Yukio acknowledged Shiemi's efforts to change and grow, but reminded her that if she intended to stay in the cram school, she needed to brace herself for the challenges ahead. He urged her to discuss her decision with her mother before the results of their examinations were announced. Amid this conversation, Yukio suddenly remembered his earlier confrontation with Mr. Nohias. The unresolved tension weighed on him and he abruptly left the shop, his expression troubled. Meanwhile in the dormitory, Rin was deeply asleep unaware of the brewing turmoil. Unexpectedly, Mr. Nohias stealthily entered his room, wielding a sharp weapon. Swiftly, he struck the figure under the blanket, believing it to be Rin. However, his attempt was averted as he unveiled a dummy in place of Rin's sleeping form. This turn of events confirmed Yukio's suspicions, and he confronted Mr. Nohias with a raised gun. Rin woke from his slumber in another room, startled and bewildered by Shimi's presence. The sound of gunshots rang through the building. The gunshots were the result of a fierce fight between Yukio and Mr. Nohias, as Yukio pursued Mr. Nohias. The battle took an ominous turn as Mr. Nohias summoned his highest-ranking Nibirius through a drawn magic circle. In a climactic moment, Rin emerged to join the fray as he struck Nibirius with his ablaze sword. However, Mr. Nohias defended himself by splashing holy water on Rin. As Rin prepared to confront Mr. Nohias again, the Nibirius suddenly reappeared, constricting Rin. Yukio intervened by erasing a portion of the magic circle, causing the Nibirius to disappear. Rin, his sword poised at Mr. Nohias's neck, demanded to know the man's identity. Mr. Nohias revealed that he was a survivor of the Blue Knight that had occurred 16 years prior. It was a night when Satan massacred the world's most prominent clergyman. His body was taken over by Satan, resulting in the loss of an eye and his family. Seeking revenge, he had targeted Rin. Despite being pierced with a sword, Rin expressed a willingness to face him as many times as necessary, as long as innocent lives were spared from his revenge. Moved by Rin's words, Mr. Nohias relented, but cautioned that others would seek vengeance. Just as Shimi reached the top floor, Rin's wounds had already healed. She insisted on healing him, and at that moment, she made her decision. She would accept the path of an X-Wire. The next morning, Mephisto announced the examination results. To their delight, he declared that everyone had passed and were now officially exorcists. In celebration, Mephisto treated them to a feast of manga. Mephisto sat outside the restaurant, making a call to someone named Amaimon, instructing them to come to True Cross Academy immediately. On a scorching summer day, under the relentless sun, a small, cute cat stood patiently by the gatepost, seemingly awaiting someone's arrival, eavesdropping on a conversation between the security guards station there. It becomes clear that this cat is a familiar, an otherworldly creature bonded to a master who has now passed away. The oppressive heat takes its toll on Rin and Yukio as Rin discusses his aspirations within the exorcist organization. Rin, perhaps driven by impatience, vented his frustrations regarding the X-Wire rank, expressing a desire to ascend the exorcist hierarchy. Amidst this conversation, Yukio sees the moment to address certain inadequacies he perceived in Rin. His concerns, while rooted in love and genuine anxiety, came spilling out. Yukio's primary apprehension revolved around around Rin's seeming inability to harness and govern his demonic powers. In his view, this lack of control had the potential to transform Rin's impulsive and hot-headed nature into reckless actions, which could be dangerous especially when dealing with demons. Yukio highlighted Rin's short temper and tendency to get into arguments quickly. He believed that this could lead to conflicts that might jeopardize their missions and teamwork. As Rin absorbed this barrage of criticisms, Yukio laid down a stern verdict. Until Rin honed his skills, resolved his shortcomings, and acquired valuable experience, he would not be entrusted with missions. These comments were not born of cruelty, 
but rather from Yukio's earnest desire to see his brother flourish and mature into a skilled exorcist. The fragile tension of this conversation soon shattered, escalating into a heated argument. It was in the throes of this emotional tempest that Rin inadvertently shattered Yukio's glasses. Before this familial dispute could escalate further, Yukio received a crucial mission call, requiring his immediate attention. Despite Yukio's assertion that Rin was far from mission ready, Rin was unwilling to remain on the sidelines, disregarding his brother's warnings. Ignoring the boundaries set by Yukio, he stealthily shadowed him, determined to confront the unknown menace himself. What awaited Yukio at the mission site was a rapidly unfolding crisis where chaos reigned supreme. He received an update from an on-site officer. Kuro, a cat society guarding the south rear gate, has gone berserk. A cat city is a type of demon that inhabits cats. The tranquil and beloved cat familiar that had been observed earlier at the gate had transformed into a larger, more menacing entity, and multiple exorcists found themselves locked in a fierce struggle to subdue the beast. The trigger for this rampage was the cat overhearing the security guards discussing the death of its former master. The master in question was none other than the revered Father Fujimoto. Kuro, the cat Side, had been Father Fujimoto's loyal familiar, serving as both guardian and companion. This particular cat city's origin had been revered as a protective deity of silkworms for centuries in a part of Japan. Generations had worshipped him at a local shrine, fostering a coexistence between the mystical creature and humanity. Regrettably, the ravages of time and societal shifts led to people gradually forgetting about him. As people's devotion waned and his shrine stood deserted, Kuro was, with a heavy heart, thrust into the realm of demonhood. In a prior outburst, only Father Fujimoto, during his time as a paladin, had succeeded in soothing this deity-turned-demon without resorting to bloodshed, forming a sacred bond in the process. Father Fujimoto named the creature Kuro and sealed their pact, entrusting him with the vital duty of guarding the True Cross Academy. As exorcists grappled with the task of subduing the frenzied Kuro, they reached a desperate puncture where they had to resort to a supposed medicine that Father Fujimoto had entrusted to Yukio before his death. The expectation was that this mysterious concoction would eliminate Kuro. However, a remarkable twist emerged from this crisis, one that pivoted the narrative. Rin, bearing the unique gift of hearing Kuro's unspoken thoughts through his demon powers, acquired insight into the cat's profound grief over the loss of Father Fujimoto. Driven by this newfound understanding, Rin proposed an unconventional solution, to engage Kuro in dialogue and provide solace rather than resorting to the drastic measure of taking his life. In a remarkable display of compassion, Rin's soothing words acted as a balm, quelling the tempest of Kuro's emotions and returning him to his earlier, more endearing state of bawling in tears. A sense of peace descended upon the Scene, and the cataclysm that had threatened to engulf them all was averted. Amidst the chaos, Mephisto and an unidentified figure observed the unfolding events, with a distinct interest in witnessing Rin's powers. As Rin refrained from displaying his abilities during the incident, leaving his true strength concealed, Mephisto implied that this mysterious individual might provoke Rin to unleash his full potential. The mysterious man departed, expressing his curiosity about Japan and his older brother, referring to Mephisto held in such high regard. A man in a boat in the sea controls his ship as he is determined to find a sea demon, which eventually appears. Renzo is excited as he gets to the ocean with Rin and Izumo. His excitement is, however, halted as he helps with the grilled squid shop while Rin grills the squid. By the beach, Rin advertises the grilled squid to passers-by. Rin explains that he doesn't really mind doing jobs like that, but is concerned that there are no buyers as the squid looked good. Renzo and Rin conversed on how Tsubaki brought them to the beach to find seaweed for use and demon warding potions on the pretext of going on a mission. Izumo then came out of the ocean house as she went to the beach, saying it was her turn to swim. Tsubaki arrives in beachwear and commends Rin and Renzo for grilling the squids. In the middle of the ocean, Izumo stared at the sky when suddenly her leg became cramped. A little boy sights her fidgeting and hurries to her. He mistakenly headbutted her and she became unconscious. On the beach, the boy was about to give her mouth to mouth when she woke up and hit her head on his chin. The boy explains that he saved her and compliments her for being cute. He then introduces himself to her as Yohei. Rin and Renzo came running in as they had heard about Izumo being rescued. Renzo was teasing Yohei for being short when they suddenly heard a loud scream and people running in a particular direction. Yohei also runs off, leaving them. Rin, Renzo, and Izumo hurried to the spot where the people gathered and were shocked as a large part of the sea was dark. An old man at the scene informs them that it was caused by a demon and narrates a legend that was passed down for centuries, that when the sea becomes dark like ink, a demon about the size of a mountain shall appear and write out the village. The old man informs them that six months ago a fisherman set out to defeat the demon, but he never returned. As they walked back to the ocean house, they bumped into Yohei. Yohei apologizes to Izumo for hitting her on the forehead. Rin complains, saying Yohei could have avoided bumping into them, but Yohei says his father always told him a man has to walk a straight path. 
As they walked back from the pet shop, Yohei told them about his father, who went missing six months ago on a mission to capture the Demon of the Deep Seas. Determined, Yohei firmly tells them he will defeat the demon who killed his father. During dinner, Tsubaki tells them about Kraken, an ink-spewing demon. Tsubaki receives a call instructing them to look after Yohei to prevent him from going after the demon before leaving. After a while, Izumo meets with Yohei, and he hands her an ointment for her wounds. The next morning, the ink reappears on the sea, and Izumo hurries to check up on Yohei. She found him looking at the sea and observed him from a distance till the sunset. She confronts him, but he advises her not to lose her resolve. Suddenly, the demon appears to be advancing towards the village. Seeing him, Yohei hurries back to the village to get his tools. Rin and Renzo ran towards the ocean in an attempt to take out the squid. Rin instructs Renzo to recite his aria to restrict their demon. Renzo recited the aria, but it was ineffective as the squid left, going towards the ocean. With a loud scream, the attack hit them with its tentacles, which they evaded. Kuro then jumps on the huge squid, attacking it. Rin starts hailing Kuro to continue attacking the squid. Kuro falls back to the ground after biting the squid, and Rin rushes over to him. Renzo informs Rin that cats get paralyzed after eating squid meat. Izumo arrives at the beach looking for Yohei. Izumo tries to summon her familiar when the squid splashes water on the paper, thereby restricting her ability to summon them. Suddenly, they sight Yohei in a boat as he tries to capture the demon. Rin jumps into the water and swims towards Yohei. Rin climbs into the boat, yelling at Yohei to stop, but Yohei says he is going to avenge his father. Yohei jumps into the water and shoots the crossbow spear at the demon's fin. The squid then proceeds to attack Yohei, throwing him into the ocean. As he sinks into the ocean, unconscious, Rin swims in and saves him. Left with no option, Rin pulls out his sword in an attempt to attack the demon, when he suddenly hears a man on a raft calling out to Yohei. Recognizing the voice as his father's, Yohei wakes and swims to him. As Yohei reunites with his father, his father explains that the demon is just a mere squid. In the director's office, Mephisto stares at all the items Amaimon had bought from his tour in Japan. Amaimon then requested to know where he could find Rin, as he was already in the mood to play with him. Mephisto shows him the amusement park, telling him he will find him there. At the amusement park, Rin and Renzo tell Koniko about their previous mission. Furious, Ryuji stands up as he complains about Takara and Yamada's attitude towards missions. Shiemi then came running towards them in a school uniform, and they were left awestruck. Rin asks Shiemi about her kimono, and she replies, saying she asked the director to give her a pair of school uniforms, as the kimono were not comfortable for missions. Yukio called for their attention and announced how they would be paired for the mission. Konekomaru with Takara, Izumo with Renzo, Rin with Shiemi, and Yamada with Ryuji. Yukio explains that there is a ghost in the amusement park pulling pranks, according to the reports. Tsubaki then takes over, and asks Izumo to explain what a ghost means. Izumo explains that a ghost is a demon, who possesses the volatile emissions from the corpse of a human or animal. Yukio informs them, that the ghost is a small boy, who has been spotted all over the park. He further explains that the ghost's mischief is limited to arm pulling and skirt flipping but must be found before the pranks escalate and pose real danger. Yukio then ordered them to start their mission. Rin and Shiemi went to Mephi Land in the amusement park. Shiemi got excited as she explained how she had always wanted to visit the amusement park as she wasn't able to stand in crowds when she was little. Rin then requested that they hang out in the amusement park after the mission. As they moved further into the park, Rin heard the ghost's inner voice and told Shiemi about it. The ghost appears on the horse crying and Rin yells at it to stop crying. While resting on Shimi's breast, crying, the ghost narrates how his parents had promised to take him to the amusement park when he got well. But since he died, the wish couldn't be fulfilled. Shimi consoles the ghost by patting his head, but the ghost pushes her breasts up, laughing as if it were a prank. Rin chases after the ghost with Shimi. They split up, and Shimi runs into a room filled with mirrors, as she had seen the ghost. The ghost, however, pranks Shimi, and runs away. Meanwhile, Rin attempted to contact Yukio when Amaimon stole his sword, which was on his back. Amaimon introduces himself as a demon king and also his older brother, saying he would not be giving the sword back. Confused, Rin yells at him to return the sword. Amaimon, however, draws the sword out, and the flames emit out of Rin's body. In the meantime, Yamada was with Ryuji, busy playing games, when he got a strange feeling and climbed up a tower to check. The ghost continued to play pranks on Shimi, moving from one activity to another. Amaimon starts to provoke Rin by pulling the sword out repeatedly. Infuriated, Rin attempts to retrieve his sword as he jumps to attack him. Then Amaimon switches the power of the amusement park on as he starts singing to provoke Rin. Meanwhile, Shiemi becomes enthusiastic and starts playing with the ghost, as she realizes that the ghost has the same feelings for her. On the merry-go-round, Amaimon flicks Rin's forehead which sends him sprawling on the floor. Yamada sights it and hurries to the scene. Yukio also notices the distaste, and concludes that it was not the work of the ghost. As Rin fell from the sky, 
Amaimon repeatedly punched him, saying he was confused about the reason his father and elder brother were so obsessed with him. Amaimon punches him with brute force as he lands on the floor. Meanwhile, Shiemi was in a clown house trying to catch the ghost. Amaimon continues to punch Rin's face over and over until Rin pushes him away. As the power began to overwhelm Rin, she started throwing large objects at Amaimon. Finally, he captures him and attempts to strangle him when Amaimon creates a crack in the ground by hitting it. The floor trembled as different types of things fell down on the clown house Shimi was in. In the clown house, Shimi eventually catches the ghost and notices a huge iron piercing through the house about to fall inside. Shimi tries to leave when the iron eventually pieces through the ceiling, and she screams out for help. Rin hears her voice and immediately uses the flames to push the house away. Amemon subdues Rin and attempts to break the sword when Yamada arrives at the scene and attacks him. Yamada recognizes Amemon and requests to know the reason for his being there. Amemon deliberates for a while and the scene puts the sword back in. Yamada chases after Amemon and instructs Rin to hide his tail. Yukio arrives at the scene and Yamats interrupts their conversation, greeting Yukio. Yamada then removes her hooded clothing, introducing herself as senior exorcist first class Shura Kirigakur, sent by the Vatican headquarters to investigate the risks factors of their Japan branch. In a flashback to his childhood, Rin had angrily punched a child with blood dropping from his fist. Back to the present day, at the playground, Shura introduces herself as a senior exorcist first class from the Vatican headquarters. Shura informs them that she'll be taking Rin to the academy, as she also needs to talk to the preceptor, Mephisto. Shura then drags Rin by the neck. Yukio meets up with the other X-Wires, Ryuji, Renzo, Koneko, Shiemi, Izumo, and Takara, and dismisses them back to their dorms as the mission has been completed. They, however, see Rin being dragged away by Shura, whom Koneko identified as Tamara due to the boy's uniform pants she had on. Yukio escorts Shura as he opens the door to the center of the Japan branch of the Knights of the True Cross. As they walk in, Shura explains that their headquarters is located beneath St. Pier Paolo's Basilica in the Vatican, from where all the branches around the globe are over seen, as it has all been their duty to exterminate monsters for more than 2,000 years. Mephisto arrives with Tsubaki and welcomes Shura to the Japan branch. Shura requested to know why Mephisto had hidden the existence of Satan. Mephisto denies hiding him, saying he, Rin, will be tamed as a weapon for the Order. Shura then asks if Shiro was also involved. Mephisto replies, saying Shiro had always been taking care of him, as he, Mephisto, only stood as a guardian. Shura requested to interrogate Rin in the Great Cell, which Mephisto agreed to. Yukio tries to stop Shura from offering offering to explain everything to her. Shura, however, teases him and drags Rin along to the Great Cell. In the Great Cell, Shura explains that she used to be Shiro's disciple. She narrates how Shiro saved her from her old ways when she was little. Shura fakes being hurt and steals the sword away from Rin. Rin lets out his flames in an attempt to collect the sword. Shura deduces that the Kurakara won't be able to contain his power for long. She recalls the conversation she had with Shiro when he was alive. Shiro pleads that she train Rin if something happens to him, as she is an expert in wielding demon swords. Shura, however, however, refuses and leaves the scene. Back to reality, Shura draws out her sword and points it at Rin. Rin requested to know why his father's disciple would point a sword at him. Shura explains that on the day Shiro had died, she received a secret order from the Vatican as an inspector to investigate the conspiracy between Shiro and Mephisto, possibly shielding a Satan-related entity related to the Blue Knight that occurred 16 years ago. Shura further explains that the Vatican ordered that if the cover-up was indeed Satan-related, it should be eliminated immediately. Rin froze in disbelief as Shura started attacking him. Outside the Great Cell, Mephisto instructs Yukio to patiently wait, as there was no use in going in. As Shura repeatedly attacked Rin with her sword, she wondered what her former master Shiro had planned to do with Satan's spawn. She walked towards Rin and kicked him in the stomach, saying Shiro was wrong for believing in Rin. Rin argues that his father had protected him, as he was no coward. Rin remembers his father's dying moments and starts attacking Shura. Shura, however, repels all his attacks while analyzing the way he moves. Impatient, Shura summons her familiar and pierces through his right shoulder, driving the blade to come out at his back. Run groans in pain but grabs the sword and yells that he had promised his father to defeat Satan. Shura then remembers Shiro's words and smiles. She removed her sword and laughed loudly, acknowledging Shiro's words. Shura opens the great cell. Afterwards, Yukio treats his wounds in the infirmary while Shura hands him a wooden sword, saying she will be holding his sword till he learns how to control his flames and prove that Shiro was right. Mephisto's officer, Shura, informs him, Mephisto, that she will be staying back to keep an eye on Rin for a while. On her way 
out, she reminds Mephisto that the higher-ups don't trust him as a demon. At night, on the top of a tower with Kuro, Rin flashes back to his childhood, when he was uncontrollably angry at school and had hit a kid who was now in the hospital. His father arrives and reprimands his actions. His father walked towards him and hugged him, but Rin kept punching him. He eventually calms down, and Shiro advises him to stop being hot-headed. Rin becomes determined to cool down like his father and recalls all that happened. The next morning, Shura introduces herself to the x wires in the class, revealing that she had been in the class with them for three months and that she would be their new instructor, replacing Neuhaus. After a while, Rin enters the classroom, shocked to see Shura. Shura instructs Rin to read from the textbook, determined to become a paladin like his father, Shiro. He stands up and reads. The semester ended, and Izumo bid Paku farewell. The x wires gathered with their luggage packed, and Yukio informed them that they would be in a field drill, which would determine if they were ready to fully participate in missions disguised as a training camp in the forest for the next three days, supervised by both him and Shura. They arrived at the forest and Shima became bugged by the insects around. They walked deep into the forest through the hot sun. They got to the spot meant for the drill, and Yukio instructed the boys to help in setting up tents and lighting the fire, while the girls drew a barrier to wade demons. The sun sets, and Rin cooks the night's meal. They gathered around the fire to eat and were surprised at how delicious the meal tasted. Yukio jokingly tells them that that is the only productive skill he has. In his thoughts, Rin thinks of how his father, Shiro, had always advised him to use his power to help those around him. He thinks about how he was always ditching school, so he was never invited to such events. With eyes beaming with joy, Rin gets the feeling of having friends. Shiami stares at Yukio and smiles at how he behaves. After the dinner, Yukio explains how the drill test was going to be while Shura teases him as she gulps the true crossbeer down her throat. Yukio explains that they would be lighting some lanterns, which are hidden in the forest located within 500 feet of where they laid their tents. He further explains that whoever manages to leave and return to the base within three days will be eligible for actual combat missions. He, however, mentions that there are only three lanterns, which means there are only three slots available. Yukio then hands them a shoulder bag containing three days' worth of water, food, and daily necessities, as well as a compass, flashlight, a demon-repelling firecracker, and a single match. Shura whispers to Rin, advising him not to let his flames out as she is still an inspector working for the Vatican headquarters. Yukio advises them to light the demon-repelling firecracker to signify that they have given up, as he would rush over to them. Then they all carried their shoulder bags and heads in different directions. Ryuji reminds reminds them that they were all on their own, with no help to be rendered to anyone. As they entered the forest with their flashlights on, multiple blood-sucking moths swarmed around them. Ryuji and Koneko recite holy verses to exorcise the moth, while Izumo summons her familiar. Rin hears a loud scream and realizes that it is Shiemi's voice. He runs towards the spot where he saw a flashlight and finds Shiemi unconscious. Furious, he lets out the flames, repelling the moths, but then calms himself down as he remembers the advice Shura had given him. The moths fled and Ryuji arrived at the scene, asking if Shiemi was okay. Ryuji tells him to switch the light off, as it was what was attracting the moths, and asks him about the blue light he briefly saw. Thankful that he didn't see the flames, Rin makes a joke about it and laughs it off. Rin tells Ryuji to go ahead on the mission, as he was going to take Shiemi back to the camp before heading back into the forest. Shiemi becomes conscious and Renzo jumps in. Renzo and Ryuji both receive a message saying he needs help as he has found a lantern. At the camp, Yukio notices that Rin has let out his flames again. Yukio requested to know why Shura had not yet reported Rin to the Vatican. Shura replies, saying she wants to train him as Shiro had requested her to. Meanwhile, above the forest in the sky, Mephisto observes the camp with his brother Amaimo who planned on provoking Rin to use his flames. Rin and the others, Ryuji, Renzo, and Shiemi, meet up with Konako and are shocked to see the huge lantern. Ryuji reveals that it is called a peg lantern. He explains that during the night, it waits for someone to light it, and once it is lit, it consumes anything living to use as fuel, but it especially likes females, the kind of demon that stops when it runs out of fuel or morning breaks. Konako informs us of the formation, he had thought for five of them to jointly carry the lantern. Koneko explains that a seal will be placed on it to prevent it from moving once it is lit, while Ryuji will continuously recite the corresponding scripture. Before the lantern is lit, a lot of blood-sucking moths will be gathered to feed the peg lantern, which will be Shiemi's task, while Koneko and French will guard her from being attacked by a swarm of moths and finally Rin will pull the cart. They charged forward all in their right positions. At the base, Yukio sights a firecracker and goes into the forest to check who has given up. They got to a damaged bridge and stopped. While Ryuji kept reciting the verses, he wrote his plan on paper about making the lantern cross on its own. Koneko explains how the plan would work out. Yukio carries the cart to the other side of the bridge, with Renzo and Koneko waiting, after which he carried Shiemi halfway across the bridge. Then Ryuji, who was with the lantern, removed the seal, which made the lantern run towards Shiemi 
upon sighting her. Immediately after the lantern entered the cart, Koneko placed the seal and started reciting the verses, while Ryuji crossed the bridge to the other side. However, a monster appears from the ruined bridge and captures Rin. After securing the lantern to the other side of the bridge, Rin unknowingly falls the bridge. As the bridge collaborates, a huge blood-sucking moth appears and captures Rin. Rin tried to free himself from the demon's grip but couldn't. He instructs the others to leave but Ryuji refuses and saves him by throwing the karik on the demon's face. Rin frees himself from the grip of the demon and they flee from the scene with the lantern. Rin thanks Ryuji for saving him but Ryuji scolds him for always trying to fix everything himself and reminds him that they are all his friends. They arrive back at the base where Izumo and Tamara had already completed the task. Shura notices that none of them had given up and wonders who had set off the firecracker Yukio ran to. Shimi starts to feel a tingling in her neck. Suddenly, Amemon arrives from the sky with his hobgoblin and attempts to attack them when Shura immediately activates an absolute barrier, which sends Amemon sprawling a few distances away from the camp. Shura instructs them to stay within the barrier, as it would protect them. Confused, Izumo requested to know if the drill was still on, and Shura told them that the drill was over, identifying the attacker as Amaimon, the King of Earth. Shura orders them to gather around, as she will be increasing their defense by pouring triple concentrated holy water on their bodies, as they do not stand a chance against Amaimon. She pours the water on all except Rin and recites a holy verse. Confused, Ryuji requested to know the reason for not putting the holy water on Rin. Shura explains that Rin is allergic to holy water. Meanwhile, Yukio was busy fighting off the blood-sucking moths and noticed that the moths were feral, hence his suspicion. The students tried to contact other exorcists, but there was no reply. Worried, Rin converses with Shura about Amaimon's attack. Shura advises him to take the Koma sword and run away if the barrier is breached, as she hands him sword back. Rin hesitates as he reminds Shura that she had wanted to repress his powers. Shura jokingly tells him that she knew he had let his flames out despite her warning. She asks about how he's going to face Amaimon without his flames. Worried, Rin thinks about what she just said. They are alerted by Renzo, who asks asked Shimon where she was going as she moved towards the ends of the barrier. Shura quickly moves to stop her, but Amaimon arrives and receives her as she steps out of the barrier. Rin attempts to move towards her, but Shura stops him. Amaimon explains that he made a female blood-sucking moth lay eggs inside her, which incubated and are now feeding on her nervous system. Amaimon flees with Shiemi as a hostage. Rin attempts to chase after him but is stopped by Amaimon's hobgoblin. Shura repels the demon's attack and tells Rin to go after Amaimon while instructing Ryuji and the others not to leave the barrier. Rin chases after Amaimon who was jumping from tree to tree as he fled. Amaimon stops on a tree branch and tries to provoke Rin by saying the wedding vows to Shiemi, who is now at his beck and call. He attempts to kiss her, and Rin attacks him. Amaimon, however, counters his attacks, sending him sprawling on the ground. Infuriated, Ryuji attempts to leave the barrier, but Renzo stops him by gripping him and telling him to calm down. Ryuji, however, lets go of the grip and goes into the forest. Left with no choice, Renzo and Konekomaru follow him, while Izumo tries to convince them not to leave. In the forest, Amaimon tries to provoke Rin, who was struggling on the floor, into drawing out his blade. Amaimon then attempts to gouge out Shiemi's eye when his action is halted by a demon-repelling firecracker shot towards him by Ryuji. Ryuji, Koneko, and Renzo prepare to attack Amaimon with the firecrackers, instructing Rin to run away when he sees the chance to. Koneko mistakenly shoots the firecracker at Amaimon's hair, provoking him. Amaimon becomes angry and kicks Renzo, sending him to hit his back against a tree, Koneko jumps in to protect Ryuji, but Amaimon breaks his arm. Amaimon attempts to strangle Ryuji when Rin yells at him to stop and removes his sword from the cloth, thinking about the memories he shared with his friends. Yukio arrives at the scene, telling him not to fall for Amaimon's trap. However, Rin draws the blade out, saying he wants to use his powers as an act of kindness and lets out the flames. Seeing this, Amaimon lets go of Ryuji and Shiemi as he runs to attack Rin. Ryuji, Koneko, and Renzo stare into the sky as they are shocked by Rin's appearance. Rin repeatedly attacks Amaimon in the sky. Amaimon, however, pulls Rin's tail, making him vulnerable as Mephisto continues to observe the fight. Yukio removes the bug from Shiemi, who is now unconscious. Rin continues to attack Amaimon until the sword breaks slightly, thereby releasing his full power. Seeing that Amaimon had been defeated, Mephisto hides him in the kitchen cuckoo house, but Rin slashes the house into two as he is completely consumed by his flames. The sword continues to crack as Rin's is overwhelmed by the demonic power. Yukio and Shura escort the students into the forest. Out of control, Rin continues to wield his sword and attempts to attack Mephisto in the sky. The sword restricting his powers continued to propel him around as he wielded it uncontrollably. He eventually appeared in front of the students, and Shiemi attempted to run to him, 
yelling out his name, but her action was halted as she was stopped by the deadly gaze in Rin's eyes. Shura and Yukio try to protect her, pointing their weapons at her, but Rin charges forward to attack them. Shiemi runs to hug Rin, and he calms down as the flames disappear. A senior exorcist with the Vatican headquarters arrives at the scene standing on a building as he introduces himself as Arthur August Angel, the current paladin and Shura's direct supervisor. Arthur scolds Shura for not reporting back on the conspiracy, and cover up by Shiro and Mephisto. Arthur reminds her that she has been given another mission to eliminate any Satan-related entity. Mephisto walks in, commending Arthur for his analysis, as he congratulates him on his new paladin post. Arthur explains that reports of his Mephisto treason have reached the Grigori, and the incident just confirms it. Arthur then attempts to execute Rin, but Shura prevents him as she attacks him. Arthur then receives an order from the Grigori about being Mephisto, as a disciplinary hearing would be held against him. Arthur mentions that he will also be taking Rin as evidence. Yukio offers to join in going to the Vatican's headquarters, but Mephisto instructs him to stay back to look after the cram school students, and hands him the sword, explaining that it will no longer be able to suppress the flames due to its cracked state. Then they left for the Vatican headquarters. At the Vatican headquarters, the disciplinary hearing against Mephisto began with the Grigory and the Paladin's presence, as Rin was subdued in a glass barrier. The interrogator introduces himself as Timothy Timowan, the law enforcement director of the Order, and starts the interrogation. The interrogator questions Mephisto about the true nature of Rin, and Mephisto affirms that Rin truly is Satan's spawn. At the hospital, Koneko's hand is bandaged as his bones were broken by Amaimon. With the X-Wires present, Yukio narrates how his brother inherited Satan's power as Satan's spawn and he didn't, as he undergoes an examination every day. At the hearing, Mephisto confesses that the report about Shiro subjugating Yuri Egan's children was false, and Rin inherited the blue flames as he sealed his powers into the Koma Sword. Worried that the sword could no longer contain Rin's sealed power, Yukio stares and mentions that Rin had just awakened to it just three months ago, as he had no knowledge of his true nature for 15 years. Yukio explains that Rin might be executed after the disciplinary hearing, as the flames were controlling him since the sword was now cracked. Ryuji mentions the Kurikara, and Yukio is shocked as he had not mentioned the name of the sword, the Kurikara. Ryuji explains that he he had heard that the Kurikara was one of his family's temple treasures. Ryuji informs Yukio about the Yoshukinis, the family who forged the sword. Curious, Shiemi asks if it can be fixed, but Ryuji says he has no idea. Frightened, Koneko interrupts their conversation, asking why they are not terrified of Rin being the son of Satan. However, they all looked downcast. Yukio then stands up and bows his head, pleading with Ryuji to help fix the sword. Ryuji hesitates and looks away. Meanwhile, at the hearing, the Grigori requested to know why Mephisto had saved Rin, and Mephisto boldly replied, saying his plan is to turn him, Rin, into a weapon that would fight Satan. Confused, the Grigori murmured among themselves. Arthur interrupts and advises them not to believe in Mephisto's words, reminding them about Mephisto's personal words. After a few minutes of silence, Izumo breaks the silence and urges Ryuji to take them to where the sword can be fixed. Ryuji, Renzo, Izumo, and Shiemi arrive in Kyoto, as Yukio uses a key to open a door which leads them there. Ryuji leads them to the Yoshukini swordsmith, who jumped on him as she was excited to see him. At the hearing, the Grigori deliberated among themselves on the decision to be taken. In Kyoto, after examining the sword, Yoshikini assures them that the sword can be repaired if the iron sand is present, as it is instilled with spiritual energy. Ryuji mentions that his temple possessed thick temple nails, which they had acquired from the ruins of a burned tower. Getting to the temple, they found the priest lying unconscious on the floor after Ryuji and Yukio entered the main temple to find the temple nails. In the main temple, a demon tries to imbue doubts into their minds about helping Rin, but they overcome the doubts and exorcise the demon. Afterwards, the priests all became conscious and handed the temple nails over to Ryuji. At the hearing, the Grigori continued their argument on the decision to make concerning Mephisto when suddenly a loud thud, which shook the court, was heard. Mephisto realizes that it was his brother Amemon who had infiltrated the Vatican headquarters. As the ground continued to vibrate, Mephisto proposed a wager to the Grigori on whether Rin would become the savior of Asaya or the demon king of Gehenna. Yoshikini begins to repair the sword as she hits on it repeatedly with an armor after she has removed it from a hot furnace. Meanwhile, as she hits it repeatedly, Rin moves slightly inside the glass seal at the Vatican headquarters. Shocked that he moved, the Grigori becomes terrified that he might awaken, and the law enforcement director Timothy orders Mephisto to prevent him from awakening. Mephisto, however, refuses, stating that he is just a mere defendant and advising them to give him the order of releasing Rin to use him as a weapon to protect the Vatican headquarters. At the entrance, while charged in on a huge hobgoblin paving his way through into the court, the other exorcists shoot their guns at him. Arthur the Paladin arrives at the scene with Shura. Arthur then draws out his sword with Shura. Together with Shura, they both strike at the demon, and the huge hobgoblin disappears. Filled with rage, Amaimon yells with a loud voice and creates a huge demon made out of the earth. 
He gets to the court, sending both Shura and Arthur sprawling to the ground. He lets out a sinister laugh upon seeing Rin, and breaks the barrier surrounding the court, which breaks the glass seal that held Rin. Rin falls to the ground, laying unconscious. Excited, Mephisto instructs the Grigori to vote on whether he should release Rin in order to defeat the demon. Infuriated, Arthur yells at Mephisto, accusing him of instigating the attack. Meanwhile, Amaimon tries to squeeze Rin with the earthly giant demon he has created. An exorcist shoots at the hand holding Rin and blasts it away, making Rin fall to the ground. Frightened, the Grigori orders Mephisto to use any method to exterminate Amaimon. Excited, Mephisto snaps his fingers in the air as a signal. From the floor in the court, Yukio yells Rin's name, telling them to wake up. Seeing the sword, Amaimon attempts to collect it from him, but he passes it to Renzo, then to Izumo, and finally to Yukio. Yukio hurriedly runs to Rin, but trips over. He, however, crawls to Rin's body and places the sword on him, yelling at Rin to wake up. Immediately, blue flames engulf Rin's body. Seeing this, the Grigori are amazed as they compare the blue flames to the flames of the blue knight. Rin awakens in blue flames from his subconsciousness and wields his sword at the demon, and Amemon vanishes, yelling his brother's name. Rin then draws in his sword and falls to the ground, lying unconscious. Arthur swiftly moves to Rin and attempts to cut his neck when the Grigori stops him, stating that they have accepted Mephisto's request to see if Rin would become a savior of Asaya or a demonic king destruction. Back at the True Cross Academy, Mephisto gathers all the instructors in the cram school, informing them that Rin would become their charge at the academy. Frightened, the instructors question Mephisto's decision, and he gives them reasons for it. After the meeting, as Mephisto leaves through the hallway, Yukio stops him, asking him if he truly believes that Rin can be the savior of Asaya. Mephisto informs him of the conditions issued by the Grigori. First, Yukio must ensure that Rin passes the exorcist authorization exam in six months, and secondly, Rin must be kept under 24-hour surveillance by Yukio and Shura. At the dormitory, Rin thinks about the advice Yoshikini gave him to take care of the Koma sword, Kurikara, as it was forged by her ancestors. Kuro reminds him about class. In the classroom, Ryuji and the others, Koneko, Renzo, Izumo, and Shiemi, were looking for demons hidden in the classroom. They advised Koneko to get some rest as he had a broken arm. Then Rin walks into the classroom and greets them. However, only Shiemi replies to his greeting. Frightened, Konekomaru offers to throw out the garbage. Izumo informs him that Konekomaru is scared of him, as he is the son of Satan, who killed a lot of followers in one night. Hearing this, Rin punches the wall in anger, and a horde of coltars falls from the roof. In an attempt to save Shiemi from the demons that swarmed around her, he directed the blue flames from his body towards her. The flame burns the coal tars around her, and she realizes that the flames were not burning hot. This triggers Ryuji, and he starts yelling at Rin to stop, explaining that the blue flames can kill people, as they killed his grandpa, Renzo's oldest brother, and Konakomaru's parents on the blue night that happened 16 years ago. Rin then realizes that their families were among the people who were massacred 16 years ago. Ryuji angrily advised Rin to stay away from them, but Rin told him to believe in him, saying he's different from Satan. Then Yukio enters, instructing them to stop brawling, and drags Rin away to the training center, informing him that he will be in crash training mode every day until he becomes qualified to become an exorcist, as the order had been given by the Grigori. Rin starts his training, and Yukio advises him that he has to consistently produce results in his training to earn his friend's trust. Shura arrives and gives Rin a task by setting up three candles and instructing him to light the two candles on both ends simultaneously. She explains that he has to accept and control the blue flames. At night in the dorm, Ryuji stayed to memorize the holy verses and inform Konekomaru that he wants to win against Rin, as he still sees him as his rival. Worried, Konekomaru leaves the room for the rooftop, thinking about how Ryuji still considers Rin even after finding out about his true nature. Then suddenly he hears a voice saying he's afraid. Terrified, he requests to know who it was and the demon shows up. Meanwhile, Rin is practicing in the hallway when Izumo arrives, requesting to know what he's doing. Rin explains what he was doing and she advises him on how to control the flames. Surprised that Izumo could advise him, Rin requests to know the reason why she was not afraid of him. Izumo explains that it is a normal thing for humans and demons to be blood-related sometimes. Relieved, Rin happily thanks her for not being scared of him when suddenly they both noticed a demon in the dark end of the hallway as it attacked them. The demon further attacks Rin with multiple feathers, yelling that Rin should leave the world immediately. The demon now charges at him but was stopped by Yukio's familiar. The demon, in the form of a huge bird, blows a strong wind at them, which made Yukio's familiarity disappear while sending Rin sprawling into the classroom. The demon attempts to attack Rin when Yukio enters the classroom and shoots at the demon. The demon hurriedly fled from the classroom through the window. In the morning, 
Ryuji, Renzo, and Izumo walk into the classroom and find Yukio cleaning up the mess with Rin. Confused, Renzo asks about what had happened. Rin avoids the question, requesting to know why they were not in school. Ryuji explains that they had received an email about an urgent meeting from the director, Mephisto. Mephisto walks in, interrupting their conversation and explains that the situation was urgent, hence the reason for their being summoned. Yukio explains that the demon that infiltrated the academy is called a Gufu. He further explains that the academy is protected by Mephisto's powerful barrier, which blocks the entry of demons of intermediate rank and above. Mephisto explains the cause of the breach was either a breach somewhere in the barrier or someone in the academy letting the demon in. Worried, the students wondered who could have let the Gufu in. Mephisto, however, informs the students that he has asked the other instructors to investigate Gufu's whereabouts and instructs them to conduct an overall inspection of the barrier. The students leave the classroom following Mephisto, while Rin stays back as he is exempted from the inspection. Ryuji starts inspecting the school's barrier with Renzo. Renzo wondered where Konekomaru was, as they had not seen him through the day, and thinks he might want to quit being an exorcist due to the recent incident. However, Ryuji argues, saying it's not possible, as Konekomaru made a promise to defeat Satan. On the rooftop, the Gufu lets go of Konekomaru's body. As Konekomaru groans in pain, the Gufu tells Konekomaru that the gunshot wouldn't have hurt if he had fully given his body to him. The Gufu tries to convince Konekomaru into a full alliance with him in order to defeat Rin, but Konekomaru refuses and walks back into the academy from the rooftop. Meanwhile, Rin continues his training as Yukio keeps an eye on him. Suddenly, Yukio feels a sharp pain and excuses himself to the restroom, instructing Rin to continue with the training. However, Rin tries to escape the classroom through the window when Konekomaru walks in. Seeing Konekomaru, Rin notices a Gufu next to him standing on his shoulder. In the washroom, Yukio had just adjusted his tie when Ryuji walked in with Renzo. Ryuji informs him that they have checked the barriers on the west side and the main gates. Suddenly, they hear a loud scream and rush out to check what it is. Getting to the hallway, they noticed Konekomaru running out of the classroom towards them, trembling in fear as Rin walked towards him, telling Ryuji to stay away from Konekomaru. Ryuji, however, refuses, saying Rin is the threat. Then the Gufu appears beside Konekomaru, mocking Rin, as the others couldn't see it. Infuriated, Rin directs his flames at the demon, but Ryuji quickly protects Konekomaru with his back. Seeing that Ryuji's shirt is slightly burned, Rin calms down and inserts his sword back into the case. Ryuji stands up and punches Rin. Rin yells at him, asking if they do not see the demon attached to Konekomaru, while Yukio confirms that Konekomaru is still breathing. With a stern look, Ryuji tells Rin to leave. Meanwhile, Shura and Tsubaki sight a suspicious van. They both enter the van and find themselves in an icy forest. Tsubaki holds the door back, fearing that it might close. As Shura walks further into the desert, she discovers a ruined, abandoned lab. Back at the academy, Konekomaru awakens from his unconsciousness and sees Ryuji sitting by him. Konekomaru tells Ryuji that he is terrified of Rin. Ryuji tells Konekomaru that there is no need to be afraid of Rin, as there's nothing going on inside him apart from being the son of Satan. Ryuji then stands up to leave when Konekomaru notices the burn on the back of his shirts. The Gufu appears again and taunts Konekomaru, saying the Blue Knight would happen again if he didn't protect his friends. Frightened, Konekomaru screams out loud and accepts the Gufu. The Gufu fuses its body with Konekomaru, causing a strong wind. Ryuji notices and yells Konekomaru's name, while the Gufu flees with Konekomaru's body from the hospital through the window. Ryuji hurriedly runs down the stairs, where he meets Renzo and he informs him that Konekomaru has been possessed by a demon. Renzo quickly contacts Yukio, and he hurries to the scene. The Gufu attacks Rin and knocks him unconscious. He grabs Rin's head in an attempt to pull his neck after creating a wind barrier, preventing others from intervening. Rin defeats the Gufu by telling Konekomaru to believe in him as he orders him to jump, and he slashes the demon with his sword. With eyes filled with tears, Konekomaru apologizes. In Mephisto's office, Yukio informs him about the incident, while Shura tells him that she found a burnt-down research lab in Poland that conducted experiments on artificial life, which was forbidden by the Vatican for three centuries. Meanwhile, Ryuji, Renzo, and Izumo paid a visit to Konekomaru in the hospital but couldn't find him in his room. At the bus station, Konekomaru Maru stands by the roadside carrying luggage. Rin meets him at the bus station, requesting to know what he was doing with the luggage. Konekomaru tells Rin that he's quitting the academy because he is terrified of him. Rin tells him he sees him as a friend and convinces him not to leave, as he had believed in him when he told him to jump. Relieved, Konekomaru smiles, saying Ryuji was right about him. A few seconds later, Ryuji, Renzo, Izumo, and Shura arrive at the scene, and they all head back to the academy. In the academy lab, Yukio kept experimenting with his blood to know if he had inherited the demon's power. He adds a droplet of his blood into tubes filled with a solution, and the last test tube reacts, showing a little blue flame. Meanwhile, in the classroom, 
Renzo requested the birthday and blood type of Shura and Izumo, using it to analyze their personalities. Rin requested that Renzo also tell him his fortune, but he refused, saying he could only tell the fortune of a girl. Rin pesters him to also try it with him, while Ryuji and Konekomaru stare at them, wondering how the son of Satan had a birthday. Suddenly, Shiami screams out and informs them that Izumo's birthday is coming up on the 11th of October, with the present day being September 27th. Shiemi decides that a surprise birthday party be thrown for Izumo. Then they all gathered to plan for the party. Rin suggested presents and cakes. Renzo suggested snacks and refreshments, and Konekomaru suggested decorating the room. Then they deliberated on the present to be gifted to Izumo. Rin suggests meat, while Renzo suggests a bouquet of flowers. Rin argued that flowers cannot be eaten, while Shimi joined in on the argument, saying that there are a lot of edible flowers. Frustrated, Ryuji yells at the top of his voice and assigns different tasks to each of them. Renzo to be in charge of the present, Rin to be in charge of baking the cake with Konekomaru as his advisor, and Ryuji to be in charge of decorating the room with Shura. Frightened, Konekomaru requests that Ryuji assign him to another task, but Ryuji assures him that he is the right person for the task. Yukio passes by the classroom and overhears the conversation about the birthday. In the library, Izumo sees Konekomaru and Renzo, who were planning for the cake, and walks up to them, requesting to know what they were doing. However, Rin and Koneko flee from the library, telling Izumo it was nothing as they hide the recipe book. She further meets Ryuji and Shura in the classroom, working on the decoration, and asks what is going on, but both of them hurriedly leave the classroom. While having lunch with Paku, Izumo requests to know if she had anything to do with Renzo, as she had earlier seen them together. Izumo advises Paku that Renzo is not the right guy for her, and Paku lies, saying they were discussing the birds of prey. Meanwhile, in the dorm, Rin practices how to bake a cake in the kitchen with Konekomaru. Konekomaru worries that being alone with Rin is awkward after the recent incidents that have occurred. Rin beats the ingredients in a bowl and asks Konekomaru what came next in the recipe book. Konekomaru snaps out of his thoughts and offers to sift the flour into the bowl. After sifting the flour, Konekomaru instructs Rin to beat the ingredients gently. At night in the supply shop, while Shiemi worked on the decorations, Yukio walked in, informing her that he had ordered some personal medicinal herbs. Shiemi stands up to pack his medicinal herbs, and Yukio commends her for throwing a party for Izumo. Shiemi replies, saying the party is also partially for her, as she has never had one with friends, and asks if Yukio's birthday is close, which is the same birthday as Rin. Yukio tells her that his birthday is on December 27th, and they have always celebrated it jointly with Christmas at the monastery. The next morning in the classroom, Rin presents a large three-step Christmas cake he had made, and they are all amazed. Ryuji, however, yells, saying that it is wrong, as a birthday cake is different from a Christmas cake. They sent the cake to Mephisto as a present. Afterwards, Renzo meets with Paku outside the academy, and both of them head to a store, unaware that Izumo had followed them with a disguise. She follows them from store to store as she overhears the conversation, thinking they were dating. After shopping, they both went outside and it began to drizzle. Paku brings out an umbrella and shares it with Renzo, and Renzo leans towards Paku to remove what was stuck in her eyes. Seeing this from a distance, Izumo assumes that they were about to share a kiss and runs, yelling at them to stop, and she trips over. She confronts them, and Renzo spills the truth about the plan. At the cram school, Izumo confronts the whole birthday planning committee, and suggests that the party be organized for all of them as a joint birthday party. They all agreed and set out for their different tasks. On the day of the celebration, Rin completes the birthday cake with Konakomaru and presents it to the others. They compliment Rin for making the cake, and Rin almost trips the cake onto the floor when Konakomaru swiftly jumps in to save the cake. Then they all surrounded the cake and said, happy birthday before blowing out the lights on the cake. They then start selecting a present while Izumo converses with Yukio. Yukio says he and Rin never met their real mother, even though they were told that their birthday was on December 27th. In a flashback, Yukio thinks of how Shiro, their father, jokingly told them the story of how they were found under a bridge inside a watermelon as he tried to evade the subject about how they were found, but eventually gave them a clue that they were given birth to on a snowy day. Enthusiastically, Izumo congratulates Yukio on being born with his brother. Meanwhile, Renzo calls out to them to select a present. Yukio unpacks his present and finds a funny-looking eyeglass inside, then he receives a call. With a shocked expression, he informs Rin that their monastery was attacked. Yukio thinks about how he would always be absent if Rin was absent from the home in the monastery, as the house was always quiet. Meanwhile, Rin and Yukio got to the monastery and were shocked by the sight of webs inside the monastery. They hurriedly ran towards the woven bodies while avoiding the webs. The examiners instructed them to move away from the bodies as they were still being examined. Yukio notices an inscription written in Polish on the monastery's wall, which was translated as, I will never forgive anyone related to Satan. The exorcist informs them that one of the victims who could barely speak described the person who attacked as a man wearing a mask. 
The examiners explained that the web was spun with demonic powers, as it was hardened into a cement-like substance that enveloped the priests completely. He further explains that there's a thin protective barrier surrounding their bodies, which would only last for eight hours as they had started reciting the holy verse before they were totally enveloped. Infuriated, Rin storms out of the monastery in search of the masked man, while Yukio attempts to stop him, reminding him that he was still under suspicion by the Vatican headquarters. Yukio pins him to the wall, but Rin uncontrollably emits flames from his body and runs off. Rin runs into an alley looking for the masked man when he notices a shadow. The masked man jumps down and uses his web to bind Rin's sword, preventing him from pulling it out, while also pointing a sharply pointed wood at his neck. The masked man laughs hysterically, saying he is not going to kill Rin right away, as he wants him to experience the same agony. Yukio arrives and calls out to Rin while repelling the masked man's web. The masked man flees, jumping from building to building, and Yukio chases after him. Rin attempts to follow Yukio, but it's stopped by Shura. Yukio then enters a suspicious building and sees Neuhaus. Shocked, Yukio points his gun at Neuhaus and recalls how Neuhaus had attempted to kill Rin. He questions him about the monastery's attack, but Neuhaus feigns ignorance about it and flees through an underground hole. At the monastery, Rin tries to pull the sword that was bound by the web while Yukio converses with Shura about his encounter with Neuhaus, making him the prime suspect in the attack. Shura mentions the research lab for artificial life that was found in Poland and linked to Neuhaus. Rin then attempts to leave the room to search for the masked man when Yukio stops him by shooting a fast-acting tranquilizer into his body, which makes him unconscious. Yukio then leaves with Tsubaki and two other exorcists to find Neuhaus. They split into two teams, one with Tsubaki and the other with Yukio as they moved into the underground sewage. Yukio sees Neuhaus and points his gun at him. Neuhaus, however, escapes using his familiar to distract them, and Yukio chases after him. Yukio hears a loud scream, heads back to check on the other exorcist, and finds out that the exorcist has been woven into a web. Meanwhile, Rin awakes from his sleep and attempts to leave the monastery when Shura stops him, reminding him that he does not know how to control his flames yet. Shura brings out three candles instructing him to light two candles out of the three, with the imagination that the candle represents people important to him. Rin calms down and focuses on this task. In the alley, Tsubaki receives a call and informs Yukio that the masked man is in the boy's dorm. At the dorm, the masked man attacks Koneko, Ryuji, and Renzo, partially weaving them with webs. Yukio and Tsubaki get to the dorm and inquire about the attack from the security officer. Mephisto arrives at the scene and prepares to attack the masked man when Arthur halts his action. Arthur informs him that the Vatican had issued a warrant for his arrest on suspicion of being involved in researching artificial life, which had been forbidden by the Vatican. Mephisto leaves with him but wonders who instigated his arrest. Impatient, Yukio walks into the dorm and hides behind a shelf, seeing that Ryuji, Koneko, and Renzo were partially bound by the webs. The masked man calls Rin with Renzo's phone, provoking him to hurry to the dorm. Hearing this, Yukio comes out of hiding and throws the holy water at the masked man. The masked man repels the effect and ties Yukio up with the web. Realizing that he now has Rin's younger brother, Yukio, as a hostage, he proceeds to kill Ryuji, Koneko, and Renzo. Rin and Shura burst in through the window, with other exorcists guarding the room entrance. The masked man swiftly spun webs everywhere, restricting Shura and the exorcists. Rin, however, uses his flames to free them from the web without burning them and attacks the masked man, sending him sprawling to the ground outside the dorm. Shura quickly jumps down and unmasks the masked man. Shura is shocked that the masked man turned out to be a woman. She becomes conscious and escapes as Neuhaus prevents Shura from chasing after her. Shura, however, captures Neuhaus, who confesses that the woman is his wife. At the monastery, Rin burns all the web that had been woven on the priest's body. Meanwhile, Yukio receives a visitor who takes him to a train, where he meets an old man with a scar on his face who introduces himself as Ernst Frederick Egan, his grandfather. At the supply shop, as the rain poured down heavily, Shimi listened to the radio as it informed her about the incident that occurred in the academy. Worried, Shimi wished for her friend's safety. Her mother informs her that she will be stepping out for a while and leaves. Suddenly, Shimi hears a loud thud and goes out to check it out. She sees a lady lying unconscious on the floor and hurries to help her up with the help of her familiar, Ni. Meanwhile, in the train, Eric tells Yukio about his mother, Yuri, his daughter, showing him a picture of what she looked like. Shocked, Yukio stares intensely at the picture. Eric informs him that he is obligated to become their guardian. Rin and and Yukio, as Mephisto, the guardian appointed to them after their father's demise, was arrested. Eric apologizes for neglecting him and his brother with pain and loneliness for 15 years. He explains that he had been imprisoned after losing everything he had, including Yuri, to the massacre of the Blue Knight. Eric further explains that Yuri was executed as a witch on the order of the Grigori in the Vatican 
due to the revelation that she was bearing the child of Satan. Shocked, Yukio argues in disbelief, saying the witch hunt had ended a long time ago. Eric tells him he was also thrown into prison for being Yuri's father. He shows Yukio a necklace with a picture of Yukio and Rin, saying they were his only will to survive, but he couldn't approach them as he didn't want the Vatican to find out about their existence. Eric tells him that he is not in the position to take Rin in due to his awakening. The train enters a cave and Yukio sees a huge laboratory. Eric explains, saying the laboratory is called the Dragoon Laboratory, an anti-demon weapon unit that will be used to protect Asaya, as Mephisto was incapable. Eric invites Yukio to join him in his plan to create a new era of peace for mankind. At the cram school, Rin returns from the monastery with Subaki and heads to the great cell where Neuhaus was being interrogated. In the great cell with Shura and the interrogator, Neuhaus tells them that his wife is not a demon. Rin enters, yelling at Neuhaus to provide, as he had earlier mentioned that his family was killed by Satan. Shura reveals that she must have been an anti-soul, and Subaki explains that it is a secret technique used to revive a dead person. Shura accuses uses Neuhaus of using artificial life to resurrect his wife as he used to be head of the research lab for artificial life in Poland. Neuhaus denies the accusation, explaining that he truly kept his wife's body cryo-preserved, but never resurrected her. Neuhaus further explains how he got to the lab a certain day and found the cryopreservation capsule opened. He eventually found her and kept a close watch on her. He then realized that his wife Michelle had been possessed by a demon, but he couldn't subject her to the pain of death once again. After a while, the Knights of the Vatican headquarters seized his wife and attempted to arrest Neuhaus, accusing him of researching artificial life as they burned down his house. Seeing the fire, Michelle's is triggered by her memories and screams out. Neuhaus attacks the exorcists and flees to Japan with Michelle, as he eventually realizes that she has regained the memories of how she died. Michelle then became a demon of vengeance, using a mask to hide her identity. Neuhaus further tells him that she only has a little time left, as she is just a corpse possessed by a demon. Furious, Rin walks away from the cell to search for Michelle. Shura gives him a talisman, informing him that she had placed her familiar on her, Michelle, and instructs him to contact her as soon as she is found. Worried, Shura wondered who could have resurrected Neuhaus' wife. As Rin deliberates on how to use the talisman he received from Shura, he receives a call from Shiemi, telling him to come to the supply shop as she needs his assistance. In the supply shop in a secret garden, Mitchell becomes conscious, and Shiemi introduces herself to her as an exorcist. Rin arrives, and Ni nee leads him to Shimi, where he suddenly sees Shura's familiar, and he realizes that Michelle is there. Mitchell talks about how the garden looked like the Garden of Amahara, and Shiemi becomes excited, as she has never met anyone who knows about the Garden of Amahara. Then Rin enters, telling Shimi to move away from Mitchell as he draws out his sword. Immediately, Mitchell takes scissors and places them on Shimi's neck. She, however, faints and lets go of Shimi. Rin informs her about all that has happened in the academy, but Shimi argues that Michel is a good person. Rin draws his sword back and leaves the garden to contact Shura. While talking with Shura on the phone, he notices Arthur standing at the gate with the Vatican headquarters exorcists. The exorcists capture Michelle while Arthur pins Rin to the ground when Neuhaus interrupts by throwing a weapon in Arthur's way. Neuhaus pleads with Arthur to let Michelle go, but he refuses and attempts to strike her with his sword when Rin blocks his sword. As they continue to attack each other repeatedly, Shura instigated Rin to stop fighting back. Rin refuses to stop and attempts to attack Arthur when one of the exorcists shoots at him. Mitchell, however, jumps in as he receives the shot. Mitchell falls to the ground and Neuhaus carries her in his arms as they attempt to walk away. Arthur instructs the exorcist to seize them at once. Shiami's familiar and its friends, however, protected them by shielding them in a huge, round-woven branch. Arthur then leaves due to the Vatican summons. At the Vatican, Arthur presents himself before Eric in the court where the exorcist gathered. Eric informs him that the Grigori had been relieved of their duties as he had taken over. Eric then announces that they would be taking on an operation to eradicate all the demons in order to restore peace to the world. In the dormitory, Kuro wakes Rin up and informs him that Yukio had not been home. Rin stands from his bed and hurries to school where he meets lots of students outside the school's building. Ryuji informs them that the school has been closed due to the recent incident with the director, Mephisto, to be blamed for it. Izuma walks towards them, informing them that the Vatican's leader have been sacked and a new pope has been appointed. In the cram school, the instructors gather to have a meeting as the new director is introduced as Yukio. Yukio walks in also, introducing himself as the new paladin. Shocked, the instructors open their mouth wide. Outside the building, Shura tells Rin about Yukio's new post. Yukio walks in on their conversation and shows him a video of Eric addressing the exorcists, giving out the order to exterminate every demon in Asaya as he launches Operation Jacob's Ladder. He, 
Yukio then asks for Rin's help, and Rin excitedly assures him that he can't be relied on. Meanwhile, the instructor starts handing out new weapons to the exorcist, explaining that it absorbs the power of any demon it killed with to boost the efficiency of the exorcism. At night, the exorcists, including the X-Wires, starts their operation, exorcising hobgoblins and all demons in the forest. The weapons absorb the power of the demons into it. Bothered by the changed methods of exorcism, Rin stares at the exorcists intensely. Meanwhile, in Vatican, Yukio reports back to Eric, who is eating dinner, about the progress of the operation. After reporting to Eric walking back to the academy, Yukio flashed back to the offer Eric made to him about turning his brother back to human, and the weapon Eric showed him he had developed in 15 years for destroying Gehenna. Eric explains that he only can give the order for the bomb to be dropped and to achieve the goal, he would create an artificial Gehenna gate which required a massive amount of demon blood to be maintained. Eric assures him that he and Rin would be turned into human when Gehenna is destroyed as their demonic powers only exist there. Out in the forest, Rin gathers to eat with his friends, when a large demon boar appears running towards Yukio, Yukio shoots at the boar and it falls to the ground. Rin hears the boar's inner voice say it is the protector of the forest. Rin tells at Yukio not to shoot, but he shoots multiple times at the boar, finishing it off. Infuriated, Rin yells at Yukio, explaining what he heard. Yukio, however, replies saying he has been given an order to eliminate every last demon from the face of the earth. Rin angrily mentions Ukobak. Kuro and Izumo's familiar. Yukio then points his gun at Kuro, who was hanging on Rin's shoulder. Furious, Rin brings out the blue flames, holds Yukio's gun, thereby restricting him. Yukio then brings out his demon fingers and hit Rin, sending him sprawling on the ground as he becomes unconscious. Kuro flees into the forest in fear. Yukio receives a call and orders Borgigon to take Rin to the Vatican headquarters. At the Vatican headquarters, Shura confronts Yukio and checks his arm as she had realized that his results were positive. Yukio, however, strictly advises her not to stand in his way. Confused, Shura requested to know what his plans were, but he walks away. Meanwhile, in the forest, they submit their weapons back for collection, while Ryuji contacts Yoshiki inquiring about the weapon. Yoshikini informs him the swords are demon-slaying swords, which sucks away a human's lifeblood. Worried, Ryuji decides to meet with Tsubaki to get information. In the Vatican headquarter prison, Rin becomes conscious and sees Mephisto in the other cell opposite him. Mephisto tells him to explain how he ended up in prison. Rin explains all that had happened. Mephisto then narrates how he also ended up in the cell for experimenting on artificial life which he had ceased doing, when the Vatican headquarters forbade the act. However, his disciples continued, which led to him being blamed for the research lab in Poland. Mephisto then transforms into his dog form and escapes the prison, saying the show is just about to start. After a while, Eric visits the prison and introduces himself to Rin. At the cram school in Japan, Tsubaki informs Ryuji and his friends that Rin would be executed on the roof of the True Cross Academy. With hands cuffed, Rin walks to the rooftop where other exorcists gathered. Rin is tired, Toa stuck binding his hands and legs separately. Then the exorcists, with Eric starts reciting holy verses and the all-accumulated weapons spilled blood to the inscription on the ground. Meanwhile, Tsubaki hurries to the rooftop with Ryuji, Izumo, Koneko, Renzo, and Shiemi, while Shura prevents Arthur from stopping them. Eric brings out the Kurikara and drives it into the center of the blood. The sword emits lightning and directs it to Rin. Rin screams out in pain. Yukio arrives on the rooftop. Shocked to see his brother screaming out in pain, he requested to know what was going on. Eric tells him his brother is serving as a human sacrifice to open the gate. The exorcists all continue to recite the verses as Rin screams out in agony. Concerned for his brother, Yukio questions Eric about what he, what he was doing. Eric explains that's after years of research, he found out that the roof of the True Cross Academy built by Mephisto was the idea venue for connecting Gainer and Asia. Before that tells you that the blood that happened were of inferior quality, which made them to decide on adding Rain's blood. First, Stop Rain continues to groan in pain, has spills blood from his mouth, Stop agitated, seen his brother in pain, I points his gun at Eric or drain him to release his brother at once. Stop, Eric. However, informs him that his efforts to stop him would prove Foothill, the airplane carrying the bomb known as the Messiah, has taken off, adding for the True Cross Academy and would only explode on the grounds of the school. If the gate is not opened, stop with no choice left, I puts down his gun and offers should take his brother's place. Meanwhile, Memphis to seats in the sky on a chair observing all that was happening. As the sun set, Yukio helps his brother, who was now unconscious, down from where he had been tired and cuts his wrist, spilling his blood on the ground. As the exorcists continue to chant their verses, when Yukio lets out a loud cry as he emits blue flames from his body. The exorcists reciting the verses were engulfed by the flames one after the other, but the fire were put out with a fire extinguisher. Tsubaki, Ryuji, Koneko, Izumo, Shiemi, and Renzo gets to the rooftop and sights Yukio's body emitting blue flames. Shocked, 
Shiyumi tried to run towards Yukio, but he yells at her to stay away. Then, the Gehenna Gate appears on the rooftop floor. Seeing that the Gehenna had formed, Eric orders the Messiah Bomb to be dropped into the gate. In the sky just above the school, the plane drops the bomb directly into the Gehenna Gate. The gate sucks it in, and the bomb explodes inside, emitting a purple light. Glad that his plan had worked, Eric starts jubilating. However, his jubilation is halted when the purple light stops and thousands of demons sprouts out of gate into the earth. The gate captures Eric as he struggles to free himself. Seeing that the plan backfired, Yukio is confused. Then he hears mimicking his adoptive father, Shiro. The voice introduces himself as Satan. Yukio yells at him, blaming him for his parents' death. Satan, however, tells him he was not the one that killed Yuri, as it was Eric. Satan then share his memories with Yukio. In a land filled with ice, Shiro yells at Yuri, who was cuddling with hobgoblins. He informs her that Eric wants her back at the Vatican headquarters. However, Yuri refuses, yelling that she is not returning back to the Vatican and runs into the cottage. Shiro reports back to her father, Eric. He orders Shiro to bring her back to the Vatican by all means. Determined, Shiro goes back and starts shooting at all her demon friends. Yuri becomes infuriated on seeing this and yells loudly at Shiro to stop while emitting a blue flame from her body. Seeing this, Shiro realizes that Satan resides in her body. While lying on the bed, Yuri regains consciousness, and Shiro inquires about how it happened. Yuri explains that it was a year ago, when she with other exorcists had been sent to investigate the incidents of human combustion in the region, when suddenly they were all engulfed in blue flames. However, she had a resistance to the blue flames and decided to stay back instead of returning back to Vatican, as she wanted to meet with blue flames again. She eventually meets Satan, who had possessed a wolf. She converses with the wolf, and Satan advises her to leave the region. Yuri explains how she had heard his lonely voice and offers her body for him to dwell in her. Yuri spends time with Satan as that conversed what it means to have a life. Yuri informs Shiro that she is carrying Satan's child. At the Vatican headquarters, Shiro is imprisoned as he is accused of seducing Yuri. Shiro tries to explain that she was impregnated by Satan, but the exorcists do not believe him. At the hospital, Eric, shocked, instructs the doctors to get rid of the baby, but Yuri refuses, saying she is keeping the child. At the court, the Grigori questions Yuri about the child that she was carrying, and Yuri affirms that she is indeed carrying the demon's child. Yuri tries to make them see reasons why demons and humans should coexist. However, the entire court grumbles about what she said. The verdict is passed, and she is sentenced to death. On the night of her execution, Satan desperately searched for a human who would serve as a vessel in order to save Yuri. He eventually finds a vessel and frees Yuri, who had been tied to a tree, telling her to run away. Meanwhile, in the prison cell, Mephisto visits Shiro and informs him about the incident. As they walked out of the prison cell, Eric, who was wrapped in bandages as he had been burned by the blue flames, orders Shiro to find and kill Yuri with her child. Mephisto sets out with Shiro into the icy forest. They walk into a cave where they find Yuri holding two little boys in her hand. Yuri names the one with blue flames Rin, while she names the other one Yukio before taking her last breath. Shiro attempts to kill the babies with the Kurikara sword, but couldn't and he tells Mephisto that he would be raising them. Surprised, Mephisto bursts into laughter, proposes a wager with the condition that if Shiro succeeds in raising the children, he wins. But if they awaken to their demon powers, he loses, and they will be killed. Mephisto then seals Rin's power into the Coma Sword. Mephisto then heads back to the Vatican headquarters to report that they have been annihilated. Back to the present day, confused, Yukio asks Eric if he really gave the order to have Yuri killed. Eric doesn't deny it, saying he never acknowledged them, Rin and Yukio, as his grandsons and the Gehenagate pulls him in. Riled up by emotions, Yukio screams out loudly and Satan gains full possession of his body. Yukio becomes a vessel for Satan as he is fully possessed as he emits the blue flames yelling that the festival celebrating the advent of Satan is about to begin. Rin becomes conscious and jumps down from Ryuji's shoulder. Seeing Yukio in a demon form, he is shocked and calls out to him. Meanwhile, Shura attempts to leave the fight with Arthur, but Arthur stops saying he'll remain loyal to the orders he had received from Eric. Disappointed, Shura puts her sword down and heads towards the academy's rooftop. On the rooftop, Rin asks Yukio why he was emitting blue flames from his body, as he had always thought he was the only one who inherited Satan's power. Yukio, overtaken by Satan, yells at Rin to shut up. Rin subconsciously feels the coldness in his voice and realizes that Satan was now in possession of Yukio. Rin then requested to know why he had overtaken Yukio's body. Satan replies, saying Yukio's body was ready as a vessel before him. Rin, as the both of them have his blood present in their veins, making them the perfect vessel for him, after waiting for 15 years for them to grow up. Infuriated, Rin runs towards Yukio and throws a punch, yelling that Satan leaves his Yukio body. Satan dodges the punch and hits Rin, sending him sprawling on the ground. Satan laughs hysterically, saying it has always been his dream for the last 15 to make Asaya one with Gehenna, and to create a new world. Weak, Rin stares at Yukio as he approaches, where he sat. Standing in front of him, Satan points a gun at Rin, saying he won't allow him to destroy the Gehenna gate again, as he had previously done when he saved his father. As he attempts to pull the trigger, Ryuji diverts his attention towards him, 
and challenges him. Satan yells at him and attacks him with the flames. However, Tsubaki immediately pushes Ryuji aside, standing in the direction of the flames, and the flame engulfs him. Izumo quickly summons her familiar and quenches the flames by reciting holy verses and pouring holy water on his body. Renzo and Koneko quickly creates a spiritual armor, while Ryuji throws his crick at Satan. Their attacks are repelled by a heavy wind which sends them sprawling on the ground. Satan further attempts to burn them with the flames, but Shura repels the attack. Shura instructs Shiemi to rescue Ryuji, Izumo, Tsubaki, Koneko, and Renzo to a safe place. Rin informs Shura that Yukio has been possessed by Satan. Shocked, Shura runs towards Yukio, evading all his attacks. As she attempts to strike him with her sword, Yukio pierces through her heart with his finger and realizes that it was a clone of her familiar. At a building few distances from the academy where they escape to, Shura devises a plan with Rin, while Shimi eavesdrop on their conversation. Shimi decides to be the baiter to lure Yukio away the gate, while Rin would be the one to track the gate. On the rooftop, Satan thinks of the conversation he had with Yuri about creating a world where humans and demons would coexist. Shura arrives on the rooftop and confronts Satan telling him to let go of Yukio. Satan lets out an evil laugh saying Yukio is just a mere vessel. Determined to wake Yukio, Shura draws out her sword while Rin climbs up to the rooftop and hids while observing the Gehenna gate. At the dorm, the demons break in into Paku's room to attack her, but Izumo rescues her and takes her to the evacuation center set to protect them from demonic attacks. Ryuji notices that Shiemi was absent and becomes suspicious. Meanwhile, Mephisto observes as the fight between Shura and Satan unfolds from the sky while he sits on the chair with his brother Amemon, who had turned into a squirrel. On the rooftop, Shura tries to pull Satan out of the gate's boundary, but he's Satan doesn't budge. Shura then launches an attack using her sword, but Satan repels the attack, making her weak. Shimi arrives at the scene, telling Satan to stop and shields herself as her familiar sprouts thick plants from its body. However, Yukio pierces through the shield and grabs Shimi by the neck. Rin comes out of hiding as he couldn't contain his anger, and Satan lets go of Shimi. Rin throws his sword aside and repeatedly calls out to Yukio, telling him to wake up. Satan hits Rin repeatedly, saying the body belonged to him, but Rin hesitates, not willing to give up on his brother, and calls out to Yukio's with a loud voice. Deep in a dark place where Yukio is held down by doubts, he hears Rin's voice. Desperate, Yukio reaches out for Rin and Rin runs towards him. Rin shakes Yukio, after which Yukio shoots him in his stomach. Rin falls to the ground as blood began to flow out of his stomach. Frustrated, Yukio lets out a loud scream as he had regained half of body back. Satan tries to overtake Yukio's again. However, Yukio attempts to shoot himself in the head when Rin punches him, Yukio sending him sprawling on the ground. As tears rolled down his cheek, Rin says he doesn't want to left behind anymore. Yukio finally gains full possession of his body back as the blue flames disappears from his body and he apologizes to Rin with tears in his eyes. 